this last name, Ilan, El- Ilan, uh, Ilan Eliyahu, was murdered in that party. Bukharian guy from Queens. Was murdered in that party. And uh, as we speak, they're planning now a deal with these monster Nazis to release a few dozens of uh, women, children, old people, in order for them to get uh, five days of rest and to release 150 terrorists, women and children, terrorists, that are in Israeli jails. As far as the price, 150 terrorists for 60, 70 Jews, that's a decent price. Every one of us worth a billion of them. So I'm not complaining about that part. What I'm concerned about is those five days of rest. You see, in a boxing match, when you hit your opponent, boom, 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 any second is about to fall. It's already, you know, shaking. It's about to fall any second. Then the, the gong comes, the, the ring. Boom, he just get another minute rest. That minute, they give him water, put some things in his face, all kinds of things, takes care of the cat. He comes back again and wins the fight. Ah, you were already dead. One more punch and you will be finished. They stopped him and said, giving them five days of rest. Who knows how many rockets and RPGs they're going to get. Iran is planning probably to send them tens of thousands of things. Who knows? I don't know. I can't, re- I can't respond to this because I don't know what will happen in these five days. The Israelis already proven that they're very naive. They think they are the smartest in the world, but when it comes to the war with the Palestinians, they are fooling us for 40 years at least. Laughing in our face, double face. One half of them, let's negotiate, reach a a political solution. The other half is murdering us as usual. We found a very good trick. It's like someone said to you, listen, let's be friends. With my right hand, I'll give you punches to your face. With my left hand, I said to you, Mutsi Putsi, Hamudi, you're so nice. That's what they do to us. And you buy the deal. Imagine a wife, her husband said to you, listen, I'm not only evil. With one hand, I give you punches and break your face. And the other hand, I, you know, I show you how much I love you. You know a normal wife that would like such monster to live with her? Yes, there is a wife like this. The Israeli stupid government. They agree to such a deal. In one hand they get a punch, on the other hand they get a lituf. How do you say lituf in English? When you go like this to a baby. Huh? Don't give me hard words. Find an easy word. Huh? Caressed? Caressed? Caress? How this Hasid became the best expert in English? Can you explain to me what's going on? <laughs> How do you know such good English? I mean, come on, I mean, it's too much. <laughs> Top? Very good. I'm... Anyway, Rabotai, so what's going to be? We, know, we don't know. We'll see what's going to happen. Sometimes when you cool off, the soldiers now five days sit and do nothing, they lose their, they lose their strength to finish the job. They're not dumb. You're dealing with monsters, the devil. The devil has, uh, they smart. The Israeli lefty traders educated them for decades how to be snakes, how to fight in a Supreme Court in Israel, how to get what they want. They, they realize they deal with dumb people. We are dumb. Listen, we are dumb. Our government is very stupid. Every one of the leaders, besides Yitzhak Shamir, he was, Menachem Begin was very good, Yitzhak Shamir was very good, and after that, all of them were idiots. Rabin, Ehud Barak, Imach Shimo, 
And BB is dumb. I don't know what happened to him. He wasn't so dumb, but recently he lost his mind. And, uh, you know, all of them, basically. Bennett, this, Shemir Rachem, what kind of prime minister? Yair Lapid, he doesn't know that Yom Kippur is in the Torah. Prime minister like this fool is talking now as Hamas murdering us to call Abu Mazen back to Gaza. <laughs> such a fool. <laughs> it's like, no, Hitler, we have to kill you, but Eichmann, you come instead. That's basically what's going on here. How, how stupid you can be. He did, this, those are the clowns who are Arik Sharon, another trader. Gave all his life as a soldier. The last few years gave us the knife in the back, but the worst possible way. Everything you see now, it's his fault. Gave all Gush Katif, everything. They filled it up with missiles. So what do you see? You know, Hashem shows you. You want uh, to, to live like a clown. You want to act like a clown. One of your clowns will dominate you. I once asked, how does it work? The level of the, of the leaders is determined based on the level of the generation or the level of the generation is determined based on the level of the leaders. For instance, if you have a synagogue, you get a great rabbi, like Rabbi Victor Miller. All the people that will be in that synagogue, they must be in a high level. They must be with such a teacher. You can't stay a loser. You have to go to the very high level. But... If you go to a synagogue with one of those clowns on my blacklist, the, the clown of England, the other clown of England, the clown of the gay parade, the clown from Englewood, the clown from Boca Raton, any one of those clowns, if you go to their synagogue, what can you expect from people like this? You have to be shocked that they are Shomer Shabbat even. That's already a miracle coming from a congregation with such clown leaders, if a person there is really Shomer Shabbat, wow, you have to feel really lucky. Because look at the head. You know, in, Israel, in Hebrew we have a say, Hadag Masriach Me'arosh. The fish stink from the head. It's just an expression. The fish is stink from everywhere. <laughs> the rosh, the zanav, the middle. But the expression means... If you see a fish that is fully stink, it starts from the head. Meaning, if you see a group of people that they are terrible, check their leader. Is the reason for it. Tov. It's sim- simple common sense. The question is, which one, according to the Torah, it's more accurate? The level of the people is based on the level of the leader? Or the level of the leaders is based on the level of the people? Not an easy question. The people what? The, but it's the level of the people that's what kind of leader they get. So first you check who the people are, and based on that you decide who their leader is going to be. You're very right. If you have a, a congregation that everybody comes with shorts and sleeveless shirts and a yamaka size of the quarter and some guys with ponytail, all their tattoos are fleshed. This is the kind of minyan. Ten gays over there. <laughs> you know, the gays are ha- shaliach tzibur. And you bring a holy rav to that place. How long it will take until he resign? Two hours the most. He will realize what he has to deal with. So, uh, excuse me, actually, I changed my mind. Why, Rabbi? Change and make an impact. It's a lost case. Shouldn't waste time here. It happens in many places. In many places, unfortunately. So you're right. If the people there are wicked and behave terribly, a real kosher rabbi will not agree to be there for an hour. But it's also the other way around. If you have a city full of wicked people... Who is going to be their leader? The level of the people, one of them has to be the leader. And everyone is terrible. So the, the level of the people determined from Hashem 
who is going to control them. You want to be supportive of gay community? We'll get you a liberal university faker to be your leader. You very much against abomination? We'll get you a real kosher rabbi. That we're not allowed this kind of behavior in a shul. So tell me who you are. I'll tell me who your rabbi, who your rabbi is going to be. But it's also the other way around. If you have a good leader, he can make an impact on a place and slowly, slowly make them a lot better. We've seen cases like this. That people were in a certain level and after two, three years, there's a revolution in a place. I've seen places like this. You see that the community became a lot better than the last time I was there. And everybody gives credit to that Chacham that made that revolution over there. Slowly, slowly, he made some rules and decrees cleaned up the place, people become more Bnei Torah. So under an Orthodox, I'm going to get here. In one hand, he wants to be Shomer Shabbat, learn Torah Daf Yomi 45 minutes, and then go to the university and be a criminal attorney, destroy people's life, and then go to Mincha and Meiriv, Ashrei Yoshvebeteicha. Just an hour ago, you moister, you finish the life of a kosher Jew, because you're working for the attorney general, another monster. You sold your God for a penny, for a few thousand dollars. What kind of a religious person you are? You have to make up your mind. Are you Yaakov or you Esav? She doesn't know it's two people in here. So she's very concerned. Split personality. One hour is a big tzaddik. The other hour is Bernie Sanders. What is going on? So she goes to ask the Gdol Ador. Who's Gdol Ador? The Rosh Yeshiva. Who is he? Shem. Why I don't say Ever? It was Yeshiva of Shem Va Ever. Ever was his Nin, grand grandson. You have Ravovadia and you have the son of his grandson. I don't know, 20 years old, 25 years old. He's 90, he's 25. Who is the Rosh Yeshiva here? When you come to ask a question, you go to the grandson? No. But it's interesting because they call the yeshiva, yeshiva Shem Vaever. Meaning it's mamash, it's like you're talking about two individuals, two equal individuals. Some says that the reason our name is Ivrim, our language called Ivrit, it's two opinions in a Gemara. One opinion is thanks to Avraham Ivri. Then he was, Ever means one side. He was in one side of the world and everyone was in a lie, lived in a lie. And one person is in their correct side. So that's why they call him Avraham Ivri. But some say no, it started before Avraham. Before Avraham. Who? Ever. That's why they call Avraham Ivri, because he came from the, from the descendants of, of Ever. Ever Ivri. Knan, Knani. This is how it goes. So, in a way, Ever was an important person, but everybody understands that Shem was Gdol Ador. So she comes to Shem, Kvod Arav, I have a big problem. Can I get 45 minutes of your time? Tov, Baruch Hashem, he gave her the time. She cries about the baby that she's going to have. And what does he say to her? Two nations are living inside you, meaning going to come out of you. Meaning, you don't have one, you have two. So now she has a huge relief. Why does she have a relief? What's, go what's good about it? You have one son is tzaddik, and the other one is a sav, Nazi. The father of all Nazis, and Amalek, and the Romans, and Babylonians. So many tragedies came out of him. One hand, you have Baruch Hashem at Tzadik, no? Yaakov, the founder of the Jewish nation. On the other hand, you have the founder of the Amalekim, of the Nazis, of the Romans, of all the horrible monsters that came to the world, including these Palestinians who are mixed with Amalek as well. So all the evil is about to come to the world, but all the greatness is also about to come to the world. If somebody would ask you, what would you like? Two simple religious kids, Baruch Hashem, the Shomer Mitzvot, none of them is a huge holy tzaddik, 
at least they keep Torah and mitzvot, or one, gdol ador, and the other one, gdol anatsim. Which button you will hit? Two simple religious boys, nothing special, nobody will know them, they come, they learn an hour a day, keep Shabbos, eat kosher, make Birkat Amazon, listen to some lectures on YouTube, Little yamaka on their head, tzitzit. Baruch Hashem. Nice, decent people. Nothing special though. No one is holding them anything holy. But Baruch Hashem, Shomre Shabbat. Or one son, Rav Ovadia, the other son, Bernie Sanders. <laughs> Which deal you would take? The, you're only responsible what your son is doing if it's your fault, meaning you put him in a bad yeshiva for different reasons. And that yeshiva destroyed him. Then it's your fault. You gave him a bad personal example. You watch things on a, in a living room on a TV while he was a child and he saw all the dirt over there and he became like that. Then you're responsible. Uh, but if you did everything correctly and he met some bad person out there, and he destroyed him. That's not your fault. You're not guilty. Anus Rachmana Patre. You know, I once say the word of Rav Shlomo Zanman Oyerbach, Zatzal. Why in a bar mitzvah, when the boy co- goes out to the Torah for the first time, your boy is bar mitzvah, the father has to say right after that, Baruch Sheptarani Me'onsho Shel Zeh. Bless you, Hashem, for releasing me from the obligation and the punishments of this boy. Meaning from now on he's independent. He's a man. He's responsible for his actions. For good and for bad. I'm no longer responsible. True or false? So Rav Shlomo Zalman Oyerbach in, in the Bar Mitzvah of his son, he made the bracha with the name of Hashem. Normally, nobody say the name of Hashem in this bracha. It's bracha without Shem and Malchut. Baruch, you don't say Baruch Ata Hashem Elokeinu Melech HaOlam. You don't say. You just say Baruch Sheptarani Moshosh Shlze. You skip the names of Hashem. But he got up in the Bar Mitzvah and said Baruch Ata Hashem Elokeinu Melech HaOlam Sheptarani Moshosh Shlze. Of course, all the rabbis, all the chachamim, everyone was shocked. Ma? He made bracha with the name of Hashem, they quickly ran to him. Kvod Arav, tell us what's going on here. They obviously knew it's not a mistake. Because every fool knows that that's what you do without the name of Hashem. Needless to say, one of the biggest rabbis in the world, main posek in Ashkenaz. So if he did it, we are dying to know the reason. Very curious. Rabbi, Rabbi, what, tell us what happened here. We know the custom is not to say the name of Hashem. So he asked them, but do you know why we don't say the name of Hashem? Let me tell you why. Because are you allowed to say bracha for a lie? Can you eat chametz and Pesach and say Baruch Atah Hashem Elokeinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kiddushanu Mitzvotah Vetzivanu to eat chametz on Pesach? Can you say such a bracha? You're going to get a huge punishment for that. Because first you make a bracha for a lie, and second you carry the name of Hashem in vain, which is in the Ten Commandments. And there's no forgiveness for that if you do it purposely. Can you say bracha, Baruch Ata Hashem, Elokeinu Melech HaOlam, to be a thief? Asher Kiddushanu Mitzvotav Tzivanu, Liot Ganav. One thief was, he died, and his son didn't know what to write on his father's grave. So he came to the place when they make these pieces, you know, the marble. He said to him, listen, my father wasn't, let's say, he wasn't such a big tzaddik. His job was to break into people's homes and steal. What should I write on his tombstone? Stone. Tombstone, sorry. Tombstone. So the <laughs> guy said to him, we will write that he never walked Arba Amot without Netilat Yadayim. 
what Netilat Yadai means? Taking. Nutel means to take. He, he made sure not to walk for a step without taking something that is not his. Mm-hmm. Then the other guy from the marble store say, I have a better idea. What? We should write Poteach Sha'arim Bidvuna. Poteach Sha'arim is very good in opening gates. <laughs> so, you know. Anyway, so we cannot make a bracha on a lie. Ken sa asher kilshanu mitzvota vetzivanu lechol chazir, to eat pork. Obviously, it's a lie. Okay. So Rav Shlomo Zanman Orbach say, how can a father say, bless you Hashem, say the name of God, for releasing me from any obligation and responsibility on the life of this boy, when it's a lie? Hashem is not releasing you from any responsibility. Because the reason your boy is committing sins from now on, it's 100% your fault. You told him to be a liar. You told him to dress the way he dressed. You told him to admire sport and all kinds of garbage. You disrespected the rabbis all day, you spoke against them, he became like you also. You told him to come to shul at 10 a.m. in the morning with no shame, when it's almost mincha. So everything bad he does, it's all on you. Or you send him to college. You destroyed his neshama. Ah, now he married Christina, he met her in uh, NYU or Harvard. And he has four kids and they're all goyim. And one of them became Adolf Hitler, will, will murder 50 million people. <coughs> Who is responsible for that? His father. One who gave him such education is responsible for everyone that died. Responsible for everything horrible that came out of that son. If you gave him the proper education and you save him from all the evilness of this world, this would never happen. So can you stand in a bar mitzvah, say the name of Hashem about the lie? Don't kid yourself. You are 100% guilty in all his crimes. But I, who is I? Rav Shlomo Zalman Oyerbach Zatzal. I know for 13 years since this boy was born, I did not make even one mistake with his education. Give him the best personal example. I put everything I could into making him a Talmud Chacham to love Torah, to learn Torah to have good midot, to be zealous to Hashem. Since I know I have Baruch Hashem was successful not to make even one mistake with him, why shouldn't I say the name of Hashem? Do you know what it is? Here you have to be super, super perfect and righteous or super, super wicked faker. There's no in between. We have two options right now. One to say that Rav Shlomo Zanmai Norbach, Mamash Malach, Malach Hashem Tzvaot. Not to make one mistake with your child 13 years? Do you know what it is? 24-7 for, for 13 years? From, from the minute he, he was scrolling on a rug until now, now one mistake, now one incident? Almost impossible, but he made it. If you don't want to believe it, you're basically saying that he's a faker, liar, full of ego, in front of everyone, he's trying to, to make a show. Such a tzaddik, he can even think such a thing. Shame on you to even think such a thing. That's why I once said to someone, said, I've been seeing on Abba Shaul Zatzal, there was one bus driver in Yerushalayim, not religious. He drives the bus, you know, in Yerushalayim, very hard to be a driver. It's very, very, it's like Manhattan, very, very tight. And a little girl jumped into the road in the last second, and he hit her. And she died on the spot. But the worst part is that her mother sitting first row on the bus. She actually saw that the bus is hitting her daughter. In the neighborhood. This is what she saw. Ah, oh, everyone in the bus crying, screaming, the driver is fainting. So after everything, the mother said to him, you took a soul? 
He apologized to her. You saw it wasn't my fault. Wow, how can you forgive me? She said to him, listen, it's too late for that now. You took a soul, return a soul to Hashem. He didn't understand what she's talking about. How can I return the soul? I will give everything I can to bring her back to life. He said, no, you cannot bring her back to life. Bring yourself back to life. You mechalel Shabbat, you have no connection to Hashem. Hashem lost someone that was attached to him. You got to give him now something instead. He lost the daughter, let him get a son back. Of course, I'll be religious, I'm accepting on myself to do tshuva. If you just say that you forgive me, I forgive you. If you become tzaddik, I forgive you. Top. He became tzaddik, he kept his word. But from the minute it happened, they fired him, the bus company. We cannot find a job. He's struggling a lot. Someone told him, go to Rav Ben Tzion Abba Shaul. Rav Ben Tzion Abba Shaul will tell you what to do to have a tikkun. So he came to Rav Ben Tzion Abba Shaul Zatzal and he said to him, you have to leave Israel and you have to make sure every week to travel to a new place. Do not stay in the same place more than a week. Do not stay more than a week in one place. Meaning now you're in Queens, from there move to Long Island, from there move to Brooklyn, from there move to New Jersey, from there move to Monsey. Move, keep moving every week, different place. Until they will offer you a shiduch, the girl will be a perfect shiduch, you will get engaged and move with her to Israel and get married and your tikkun will be over. And that's what he did. He went and he was moving from one place to the other. Approximately after three years, he found a shiduch. They moved to Israel. He got married and that was the end of it. So now, if you are such a holy, righteous, humble tzaddik, someone that just had a tragedy, he hit a girl, he has no day, no night, he has no life, no job, comes to cry to you about his problems. If you come and say to him, get up, leave Israel, go now to America, to England, to France, I don't know where, move from one place to another, torture yourself for four years. Either you are a holy prophet with Ruach HaKodesh, or you're the most wicked person on earth. There's no in between. Do you understand what I'm saying or no? If someone will come to me and I will tell him something like this, I have to be extremely evil to destroy his life even more. Make him move every week to a new place. For what? I would be severely punished for giving such an advice. Unless, if I see it clearly in a, in a Ruach HaKodesh, and someone so holy and so righteous will dare to torture the life of a person, we won't do it. Anyone here will do it to someone? Your heart wouldn't let you. From here you see that some Chachamim definitely had Ruach HaKodesh. Definitely. I saw one time in my life, in my own eyes, Ruach HaKodesh. I told you once the story of Rav Nathan Vuchtfolgel, Zatzal, the Mashgiach of Lakewood. It was a story with me, about close to 30 years ago. And that's perhaps the only time I saw in my own eyes a proof that there is such a thing, Ruach HaKodesh, without a doubt. He was able to know things about me which no one could even guess in his wildest dream. How is it possible? Yeah, it's Ruach HaKodesh. So, Rabotai, now we have, a, we have an issue here. Listen to this. By Trotzetsu Abanim Bekirba, Rashi writes, based on the Midrash, Rashi, almost everything he says, it's either Gemara or Midrash. Almost everything. So, you know, if you know, if you have Bekiut, you know a lot of Tanakh, you know Midrashim, you know all the Gemara, you will always almost know what Rashi say in advance, even before you read it. Why? Because it's, it basically brings you the sources. So, it says like this, Rivka comes to a place of a Torah of Shem Vaever, Yaakov wants to come out, pushing to come out. She passed by the idol worshipping temples. Esav is pushing to come out. Chazal are asking, we understand Yaakov couldn't come out. 
because Eitzav is blocking him. When the mother comes by the yeshiva, Yaakov wants to come out, but Esav is blocking the exit. It's blocking. You have two twins. One is inside and one is closer to the exit. So the one who is inside is stuck. Just like you, you sit in an airplane by the window and you have one right in the middle. He can't get out until he would let you go. So... If Yaakov is stuck, he's trapped, he cannot come out until Esav will go out, we get the point. But why Esav didn't go out? Who stopped Esav from going out? He's right by the temple of the idols. He say he wants to go out. He push, he bang. You hear, boom, boom, on the stomach. Why, what stops you from coming out? Just come out. Some babies came out in the seventh month, eighth month. No one's blocking you. Come out! You, you understand the question or no? <laughs> the answer, Rabotai, is we have a rule that Hashem made in a creation. It's a rule. Just like you know the sun is rising in the morning, it's going down in the evening. There are rules. You have oxygen, you have water, you have fire. Nature has billions of rules. And they are working beautifully, like a computer. Everything in its place, in the right time, right timing, perfect. One of the rules is, Esav Sonele Yaakov. There will always be anti-Semitism. Children of Esav will torture the children of Israel. And the children of Ishmael as well. Other nations, China, this, all this Oriental, uh, Thailand... Uh, Korea, they don't have any interest in a, in a Jew. Some of them admire the Jews. Some of them can care less about them. They don't care. They have no, no desire to come and kill Jews. Whatever China does, supporting Iran, it's all business. They're very much into money. They want to make money. They have to feed two billion people. They'll sell their soul to the devil for money. But it's nothing personal against Israel. If the Jews would be two billion like the Arabs, I have no question in my mind they will kick the Arabs to the garbage and run to do business with the Jews. The Jews don't have what to offer them. It's only 15 million. The Arabs are two billion. By the time we finish the lecture, we'll be 2.1 billion. So the Chinese have a lot of customers. What do they need us? They care about Israel? They care about business. They want money. Everything is made in China today. Everything. So that's why, although they admire the Jewish wisdom, and many of them, I know one, I have one student, he's a professor that speaks fluent Chinese. You can Google him. His name is Professor Daniel Hasidim from Israel. He was a messenger of Netanyahu to China, like a diplomat. He arranged for me a few lectures in give a time, that's where he lived. He took me to the house of his uh, uncle, uh, the, the head of club hotels in Herzliya Pituach, Nisan Chakshuri. Allah Shalom, he passed. He had long cancer even though he never smoked. Age 65, I think he passed. He spoke in his house in Herzliya. So this Hasidim, he wrote books in Chinese. That's how smart this guy is. Baruch Hashem, Baal Tshuva. He told me, you don't know how much they admire us. Forget it, I used to speak to them Chinese. They would ask about the Jews. They have in their tradition great admiration. And what about the Arabs? They can't stand them. They're allergic to Islam. They don't allow even a group of Muslims in China are not allowed to gather together and pray. They can't stand Islam. They have camps in China that they're torturing Muslims from morning to night to re-educate them. Two million Muslim Chinese, they butcher them and beat them up and they make them scream, Muhammad is a dog. <coughs> Islam is false. Only after they are convinced that this person is already modified, is not going to be anymore talking about this Islam nonsense, they let him out. And they monitor you. You know, there's no human rights there. Nobody can tell them what to do. They can come take away all your money from the bank in one second. There's nothing you can do. There's no liberal Supreme Court. 
to defend the murderer from the Hamas. There's no such thing in China. You know, when I was there, one, guy, one Israeli guy, an uh, import and export, that's his business, in Guangzhou. So he told me, you see this guy? He invested one million dollars to renovate his office. Big office, nice, mahogany, wood, marble. <laughs> A week after, Chinese police came to him. You have two days to evacuate your office. We're bringing this building down. We want to make a road here. Ma, I just finished to invest a million dollars. Too bad for you. We're sorry for you. There's nothing you can do. can appeal. They decided to do Olympic Games over there. They stood with big semi-trailers on the roads, on the major roads. They don't want scooters. No motorcycles. They stood by the road, <laughs> every motorcycle, that car, <laughs> stop him, take the motorcycle, put it inside the truck, walk. <laughs> Now walk. For the time of the Olympic Games, we don't want uh, motorcycles. What happened to my money? Good luck. Nobody to talk to. Of course, it's terrible. You live in a place like this, you have zero rights. It's, it's terrible. But he told me... He told me that, you know, they admire the Jews and they cannot stand Islam. So why do we take the Arab side in the United Nations? Why do you want them to lose two billion customers for the beautiful eyes of the Jews? That's all business. By the way, it's not only Chinese, it's Europe, it's America, it's everyone. We try to swim between, not to lose the customers. One day, if Hashem will do some kind of a miracle that the oil will be meanless, you know, you want, you're not going to need oil. Cars would run by water or by the sun. Nobody would need to buy gasoline. The price of a barrel of oil will go down to zero, less than this bottle of water. It happened in the corona. Nobody bought oil. Millions of barrels of oil were stuck in the ocean. The price of a barrel of oil went down to minus $30. Did you ever hear that you come to a supermarket and you see a product minus $30 in Walmart? Excuse me, what does it mean minus $30? We are begging you to take it. Nobody takes it. If you take it, we'll give you $30 a gift from the register. Did you ever hear such thing? It never happened, right? But with oil, it happened in the, in the middle of Corona. I look at the computer. I see barrel of oil, negative $30. Immediately, I call one of my students who's an expert in uh, commodities and this. I said, tell them, David, what's going on here? <laughs> I said, there has to be a mistake here. I said, no, no, it's not a mistake. There are so much oil that nobody buys, nobody drives, quarantines everywhere. So the, the purchase of oil barrel went down by 95%. And they have production. They don't know what to do now. They have no place to store it. It's stuck. They have to pay labor every day. They have thousands of people standing there doing nothing. They want to clear their storages. We're begging you, come take, we'll pay you $30. Why? Because it costs us more to store it. It's simple uh, financial calculation. We rather pay you $30 than pay $100 to the place that store it. So imagine if we get to those days, but it will be forever. That's it. Oil will, will be like water. No value. What exactly the Arabs are going to do? Their power will go down to complete zero. I saw an uh, Egyptian journalist, Muslim, Arab from Egypt, speaks on TV in Egypt. You have to see the five minutes from this Arab. You have, they have translation. You know what he says? The Arab, if I would say, it, say oh, you're racist, you this. An Arab Muslim from Egypt, reporter from TV. He said, if the Arabs will die tomorrow, all Arabs in the world, the world will not feel any problem. Because the Arabs never contributed anything to the world to begin with. It will actually be a huge relief for the people of the world. No one will kill them. No one will torture them. They won't have to invest in security. Did the Arabs ever invented something? Did they ever, ever invented some kind of a medicine? Something in science? 
אין ערב. Besides killing each other, what else do we do? Killing each other and killing others. And there's nothing else we do in the world besides killing. Give me one reason why the world should miss us after we'll be gone. Good question. We have to check with Cairo TV. It's a good question. Is he still alive? Usually in order for you to, say, to have such a monologue on TV, you have to be a super powerful, you, you confident with yourself. Somebody, nobody will not dare to speak like this. If you a great reporter, I don't know, in CNN, you have two, three hundred million followers, you can basically say whatever you want. Everyone will bow down to you. I guess it was an important, uh, you see, it's a nice studio in a, in a, on Prime TV. You, get, you have to see what he says. And it goes all over the Arab world and they see it. The question is, can they contradict him? You can scream and bark as much as you want. Do you have what to say against? Many times people argue with what I say. So, okay, prove me wrong. Let's see. The politics begin. Nah, but this, just say. What I say, it's written in the Torah, black and white, yes or no? Eh, but, yeah, eh, but you know, but... Eh. Yes or no? <laughs> Similar to this, do you condemn the Hamas? Eh, eh, you have to understand. Yes or no? I will answer. Give me a minute. Wait. Uh, is Hamas is a terrorist group? Eh, you know, I mean, you have to understand. It's, it's a catch-22. If you say yes, he just lost hundreds of millions of supporters who are pro-terrorism. If we will say no, you know, he just lost all the Jews, all the powerful people in the industry. What are you going to do? It's similar to the rabbis in the time of Achashverosh. He didn't know Achashverosh if he should kill Vashti or not. So he came to Yodea Aitim in a Megillah. Megillat Esther. Megillat Esther, it's equal to 17 mezuzahs. But the cloth, the parchments, cost a lot more. Because in mezuzah you have smaller ones. 17 mezuzot, it's much less cloth. The cloth is much more, more, much more expensive. But in Megillat Esther, it says that Achashverosh came to the Goim to ask, they all say, kill Vashti. Now he came to the Jews, I want you to rule. You, your day team. What does it mean, your day team? You know times. What do you mean, you know times? You have a watch? No, you know how to renew the moon. You follow the moon, the renewal of the moon. You know when is Rosh Chodesh. Meaning you have divine wisdom. I want to hear your opinion. Should I kill Vashti or not? Now the rabbis knew. Whatever they're going to say, they're going to pay big time. If they say don't kill Vashti, then people would say because of the Jews, your, your wife made fun of you. The Jews wanted you to look like a fool. If you would say to him, yeah, kill Vashti, once he's not drunk, he will miss her. Rabbi, come here, we're killing you. Why? Because of you I killed my wife. So the Chachamim said, Oi li momar, oi li momar. Oi if I say, oi if I won't say. So what did they answer? From the time that the Bet HaMikdash was destroyed, this was we're talking about the first Bet HaMikdash, because this was about 2400 years ago. From the time Bet HaMikdash was destroyed, Hashem took away our wisdom. We cannot answer such a question. That reminds me of one king said to his wife, why do you go to swim in a river? This river, the, the water are running like the Delaware River. So she likes to go into the water. Even though no women back then ever dared to wear a bathing suit, of course no, you know. 
Till a hundred years ago, there's no such thing. A woman anywhere in the world would wear a bathing suit. You can see the beach in South Carolina a hundred years ago. All women were dressed like a, like a Haredi Kala from Borough Park. Everything covered on the beach. Umbrella, cover for the face, cover for the hair, sleeves, everything covered. A dress wouldn't enter the door here. It wouldn't enter. It was so wide. You know, like these wedding gowns. The Goyot of South Carolina, ni- 1910. How did they go to the water? They made special wood cabins for them with a door, like a shade. You open the door, you go inside, you hang your stuff, swim, four walls are covering you. No, of course, you're not going to swim in front of a man. Goyot! Then you have a towel, you dry out, you get, you get dressed, and you come out. Who would dare to walk with bathing suit like, a, like animal? Animals are naked in, in nature. Animals don't have problems. People understood the difference between people and animals. The world was a much more decent place, even among the non-Jews. So the king said to his wife, why are you going to swim and every person person who passed by the river have to see the queen is in the water. What is it? Fashion show? Why don't you go to some private pool that nobody comes? Why do you have to go in a public river? I love the water. It's clean. I love the view. So the king said to her, listen to me carefully. If you're going to go one more time to the river, I will divorce you and throw you out of the palace and you'll lose all your rights. She didn't believe that her husband, who is so crazy about her, will ever do such things. So she went again. And the king said, that's it. I make a vow. I make a vow. You're out. You're done. Three, four days later, he started to <laughs> miss her. He's alone in the palace, sitting, looking at all the gold, chandeliers. Why do I need all that? <laughs> He misses her. He called all his goyim advisors, advisors, give me a solution to the situation. He said, no, your majesty, you cannot make yourself look like a fool. In front of everyone, you made a vow. If you bring her back to the house, you lose your entire respect. What should you do? You should have killed her. He didn't kill her, but you can never bring her back. He's depressed another few days. Somebody told him, go to the rabbi. The rabbis always have solutions. <laughs> He comes to the rabbi. The rabbi is thinking. The rabbi said, why are you so worried? I want her. I love her. My life without her is no life. The rabbi says, so what's the problem? Tell her to come back. He said, no, but I made a vow. He said, no, the vow is not a legal vow. Wow, what do you mean? He said, you told her, I don't allow you to go into that water. But the water, when you say to her, the water that are here, they already moved to New York. That's not the same water. He spoke about the water, but the water are constantly moving. So now it's a whole new water. No problem. Legally, you can take her back. He said to the rabbi, you're going to be my right hand man. And if I have problems, I know where to come. There was another case like this, that the, the king said to the wife, he said to her, why don't you do this, why don't you do that? And uh, she, was, she had chutzpah, she's, she's not respecting him. So he said to her, I want you to apologize, and I'm eating a pomegranate. By the time I finish the pomegranate, if you don't apologize, I throw you out of the house and you're done. He finished to eat the pomegranate and she refused to apologize. Take her, throw her out. Now she walks in the street. One minute she was a queen, now she's homeless. A few days later, same story. He's missing her, but his ego, how am I going to bring her back? What's going to happen to my respect? He calls all the goyim. I cannot make, f- make, make yourself look like a clown. She's gone. She can never come back. He called the rabbi. Rabbi, what do you think? 
What did you say exactly? I said, by the minute I finish the pomegranate, if you don't apologize, I'll throw you out of the house. You see, the rabbi went down on the floor, on the rug, Persian rugs, and started to look. So what, what happened? You lost something? Wait. The rabbi found two seeds of pomegranate on the floor. He said, you see, you didn't finish the pomegranate. She can come back. I started to kiss the rabbi. Don't move out of my palace. The idea, Rabotai, the idea we have to know, wisdom, life and death is of course depend on the wisdom. I told you what happened now with the Arabs in the uh, in Sauder. They came to one house a few times. They came in and they did not go to the Mamad to kill the family. They left. few times. Different groups. Why they left? In every other house they murdered everyone. That house they came a few times, walked in and walked out. All they had is to spend another minute to go downstairs or upstairs, wherever the Mamad is, and find them there and kill them. Like they did in all other houses. But they didn't go into that house. They just walked, they saw the house, and they left. Why? Because their husband was so smart. When he heard guns everywhere and people screaming, he started to knock down everything in the living room. When you walk into the house, there is a, a plant with sand. Boom, he knocked the plant with the sand on the rug. One couch was you know, upside down. That he broke some tables there. It made the house look like a mess. So every group of Nazi terrorists came in. So, oh, they were already Hamas here. And it looks like a war zone. So they, didn't, they were lazy to go down to look for the Mamad up down. So let's move to the next house. Few times they came in screaming, screaming in Arabic. They saw the mess. They assume already that they either kidnapped the people or killed them. So they moved to the next house. And that's how the whole family got saved. See what it means, a moment of wisdom? Who gave him this idea, if not Hashem? How many people would think about such a thing? That's called a moment of wisdom. So let's move, move on. So now, why Esav doesn't come out? He can come out. The answer, Abotai... We have an halacha, a rule in nature. Esav sonel Yaakov. Esav will always be jealous with the children of Yaakov, will hate them. No matter how great they are, no matter how bad they are, it's not relevant. Will always hate them. Esav is willing to give out his desire to go out to his idol worshipping just to torture Yaakov. If I will go out, he will also be able to come out and go to the yeshiva. How can I allow a Jew to learn Torah? I am the devil. I am the Satan, Sarosh el Esav. My job is to do everything the Jews will never learn Torah. That's my job. That's the Greeks. That's the Romans. That's the Babylonians. All the children of Esav. In this parasha you see the structure of the whole world and the entire future of the world until the end of days. Everything in the parasha we read on Shabbat. Adolf Hitler in Machshimo had an interview it's called Brauschen, Brauschen. I guess it's the name of a newspaper. Interview. Reporter interview Adolf Hitler. And Adolf Hitler say, the world has two nations only. Us and the Jews. Everything else is not relevant and not important. This world has one war between us and the Jews. Two defects Judaism brought to life. One in the soul and one in the body. In the soul, 
They invented the term conscience. Matspoon. Ethic, morality, rebuking, shame on you, shame. It's all Jewish invention. And in the body, circumcision. He calls it a defect that the Jews circumcised the babies. Meaning you were 100% perfect. Now the Jews make a defect in the body of the baby by cutting a little piece from it. So now you're only 97% perfect. You lost 3% of your perfectness. Who adopted his opinion, by the way? The Israeli army. A soldier that is perfectly healthy gets a profile, a mark. What's the highest profile in the army? 97. There's no 100. Why? You think why they took 3% off if you're perfectly fine. <laughs> you're nothing missing. You're fully fine, you know. You're not sick. You're not, you don't miss any organ. Why would they mark you as 97? They accepted his opinion. Brit Mila. Today we have to ask, what about all the Russian goims and Ukrainians that came to Israel and now they are in the army? They are not circumcised, many of them. Maybe they should get a profile 100, but they didn't want to make the Jews jealous. Nikolai has 100 and I'm Yosef have 97. And I was born in, he came from Ukraine. It's not fair. Why is 100 and I'm 97? You already had a surgery when you were a baby. <laughs> he didn't have. It looks like a joke. So Rabotai, Hitler say, Machshimo, the war is only between us and, and the Jews. He didn't even know what he's saying. It's Mamash Hashem answering the interview. The world has two powers, the good and the bad. All the bad came from this Esav. The Romans, the Babylonians, the Greeks, the, the Amalek, the Nazis. Haman, Haman Agagi. Haman came from the king of Amalek, Agag. Haman wants to murder all the Jews. There's a Holocaust plan already 2,400 years ago. That's why we celebrate Purim. So all the monsters came out of this Esav. Include those Palestinian Hamas. They also mix with Amalek. You look at the Arabs in Dubai, or Bahrain, or other places, they're not as evil like them. They cannot take a baby, to the best of my knowledge, and put him inside the oven in front of his parents and turn it to 500 degrees and burn him and laugh. I know kids that went to Dubai, they were very polite and kind to them. So the Midyamaka, Bachurei Shiva, Tzitziot. Most Arabs were nice. They even took pictures with them. <laughs> they show me some of the pictures. It cannot be in Gaza. If you walk there in, in less than a minute, they slaughter you. Less than a minute. You won't be able to walk one step in the street. Anyone will see you will slaughter you. Anyone. Women will throw rocks at your head. Children that curse you and throw things at you. You go to other Arab countries, you know, the Amorites, yeah, some may hate you, but not more than the French and the British. Why? Because they are not mixed with Amalek. But those, you never saw in your life such cruelty, even not by the Nazis. Someone asked me, I don't understand. The Nazis did exactly the same thing. They also burned Jews. They also raped women. They also killed babies. Exactly what they did. They also shot people in the head. Everything they did, the Nazis did. Why you always like to say that the Palestinians are worse than the Nazis? Why? And I explained, and everyone accepted what I say. Everyone. Now one person ever argue after that. That means it's very convincing. I say it's very simple common sense. If you take a Nazi that wants to kill all Jews, and you tell them you press a button, 100,000 Jews will die in a second, but you have to lose your arm. You will have only one hand from now on. One arm. 
They will never agree. Even a finger. <coughs> Tell, hey, Adolf, you lose one finger. You have nine fingers instead of ten. But a hundred thousand Jews will fall and die right away. But I miss a finger all my life? I don't agree. But you hate them so much. Of course I hate them. I want them all dead. But I love myself more. I don't want to lose a finger. You come to any one of a Hamas, 40,000 Hamas terrorists, with no exception to the rule, every one of them would say, to lose a finger? To lose an arm? You're out of your mind? I'm going to die with my ten sons to kill one Jew, not a hundred thousand. Give me one Jew that we can slaughter him. I volunteer to die with my nine, ten sons. Ten of us will die to kill one Jew or to torture him. So who's worse? If the Nazi will not agree to take an opportunity to murder a hundred thousand Jews because he doesn't want to lose one finger, that means his hate to the Jews is up to a certain point, as long as he doesn't have to sacrifice anything. But with them, they are honored to die. For one Jew, forget a hundred thousand. For one Jew, ten of them come. They know they're all going to die. They know they come. They see all the soldiers standing. They come, they get out of the car. They know they're going to kill them, the soldiers. Once they begin to shoot, the soldiers with guns there. So they know they're not coming back. But they go, and ten of them died, and in the end you hear one Israeli soldier got killed. It happened a few days ago. They killed all of them. You see them laying on the, st on the floor. And in the end, they kill one soldier. What kind of a terror attack is this, you fool? Ten of you come to kill one soldier and all of you die? Ten for one? Of course! For us, it's better than winning the lottery to kill one Jew. But you're all going to die. Your children are going to stay orphans. Your wife is going to be a widow. You don't care about all the suffering you're going to have? The answer, absolutely not. To kill a Jew, we're willing to sacrifice anything. Except one thing. Who knows what? One thing they will never agree to compromise. Land. Hashem made them so fanatic, so devoted to the land, they are like magnet. They work with the land, they plant trees, olive trees, everything has to do with the ground. Once they occupied a piece of land, even for one day, Hundreds of years later, they dream about the day they will take it over. They're still dreaming to take Spain over. Because in the old days, they occupied parts of Spain. They say Spain belongs to us. It's occupied territories. Spain belongs to them. Why? Because they occupied parts of Spain for a while. And then the Spanish took it back. Once they take over a land, they even have nothing to do with the land. They just visit their days. They sat there for a while. It's ours. If you take the land from them, they go crazy. They are tortured. They suffer. They can't stop suffering for a second. That's all they think about. So what's the solution? You occupy all Gaza. Make a new border. That's it. You started with us, you never get it back. Go to Egypt, go to Jordan, find where to live. That's my problem. You came to kill me, you came to occupy me and to kill me. I kill you and I occupy you. Just as fair. It's a war, right? You come to kill me, self-defense, I killed you first. I killed you first, I take your gun, that's it. You killed me, you take my gun. I kill you, I take your gun. Very simple. Simple math. But those idiots that sit there in a the Knesset, what do you think is going to happen? They will do the same mistake they did after the Six-Day War. Moshe Dayan, Shem Reshaim Irkav, you know the one with the one eye? You know him? The bald guy in the one eye? He had a patch, pouch on his eye? He's a real serious lefty fool. All the Arabs ran away from East Jerusalem. We occupied the Western Wall. Everything was in our hands. They all ran away. They were sure that we were going to kill them all. Six day war. This fool started to call them, beg them to come back to their homes. We'll give you Israeli ID and rights. Can you believe that? 
All these problems you have in East Jerusalem every day now, all of that because of that idiot. Who calls them to come back? Finally, Jerusalem came back to our hands after 3,000 years of suffer. Or 2,000 years from the destruction of the second temple. He runs to call them. Hey, come back to your house. They don't belong here. It's written in the Tanakh that it's our place. They're not supposed to be there. Come, come. We are not here to kill you. All the terror attacks come from there. And they steal 100,000 cars into East Jerusalem every year. You can own a car in Israel. There's a very high chance that between now and next year, your car will be stolen. You come, you park the car, you go upstairs, you come down, the car is gone. Three minutes. They started and they drive to East Jerusalem. Ten minutes drive from anywhere in Jerusalem. They go to the border, to the Mahsom. Once they're there, no one will get your car back. Nothing you can do about it. Insurance costs ten times more. So much suffering. All of that because of that fool. That's one way to look at it. The other way is Hashem wanted it like this. It's, we have cancer inside us. Why Hashem wanted it? Because so many of us are not Shomer Shabbat. So many of us don't open a book. So many of us hate rabbis and Torah. So many of us hate modesty. So many of us are crooks. So many of us are ungrateful. And the Satan makes cases against us day and night. Cases against us. And in Rosh Hashanah, Hashem is, has to rule in a fair way, in an honest way. He's a judge. So what do you think happened? The, the minister of Ishmael comes and shows how they go to the mosque five times a day. Wash their legs. Go bend down like this. Shows you the women, even though they are pro-murder. And they dance when they see Jewish kids burning. So they are monsters, but modest monsters. <laughs> Our girls from Tel Aviv, they are not monsters. They have good heart. They're not ma- murderers. They're not happy when Palestinian kids die. The opposite. They demonstrate for them. But they dressed in a provocative way. And since modesty is such a heavy thing in the eyes of Hashem, they constantly get permission to kill us again and again and again. Just for that alone. And all the Chilulei Shabbat and all the false beliefs that we have in our life. I'll give you an example. If we trust that the Israeli army will save us, the chance that the Israeli army save us go higher or lower? Lower. Why? I'll tell you why. Lavan and Betuel. Betuel has a daughter, the sister of Lavan. What's her name? Rivka. Rivka is a little girl. Eliezer come, he brings camels, lots of jewelry, lots of uh, baklawa, maybe some falafel, some shuarma, lots of gold. He comes to the greedy Lavan and his murderer father Betuel. And he wants to take Rivka to marry Yitzchak. After so much wealth, they just got gifts and all of that. Now Lavan say, let's ask the girl if she wants to go. If she wants to go. What are they saying? Hashem yatsa davar. That's the will of God. Who are talking here? The biggest crook in the history and his father. Two crooks. Ismail Ania and Khaled Mashal. They asked them, can we get your daughter to marry the prince of the world, Yitzchak? They want to kill Eliezer. They put poison in his things. <laughs> they got, the angel moved it and Betuel died. It was, the plan was to kill Eliezer. But when they saw that none of the plans work and she wants to go, they realized it's me Hashem. This monster believe in Hashem. 
מצרית איננה תורה, they say, מהשם יצא הדבר. The lefties of Tel Aviv will never say it was God's will. They don't agree to say God. Don't talk to me about religion, oof. I'm allergic. But this monster says it's from God. From God. So they gave her a blessing. You should become a nation. You should have plenty of kids. The Torah says that's the reason she became barren. The opposite of their blessing. Why? That no one will ever say that the reason Rivka have many kids is thanks to the blessing of this filthy father and brother that she had. So from here, what do we learn? Then when you go to a fake Baba, fake Rabbi, who does all kinds of eulogies, and I'm going to give you this, put it under your pillow, close your eyes. Hashem is telling me now, there's one guy in Israel, such a faker, I want to choke him. <laughs> no, that's how he talks. Close his eyes. Hashem is telling me now to tell you, live it or not, you have thousands of followers. Then we have another Mishugine who screams such screams, Hashem irachem, if you see how, what a chilul Hashem he does. And that Mishugine bothers me very much. Why? Because what he say, it's all accurate. And it's rare. To find speaker that speaks strong and say the truth with no fear, doesn't exist anymore. But he, <laughs> everything he says is correct. But he screams like Meshuga. Nobody can listen to him. People make fun. They send this video. It becomes comedy. <laughs> Banging on the table. Someone asked me, well, what, what should I, I mean, what should I do? I said, be careful never to share his videos. It causes a huge damage. Every person who is interested in religion, he will see one minute from it. I don't, I don't want anything to do with this crazy wackos. So, Rabotai, Hashem, because you count on a fake Baba, because of that you're not getting what you wish for. Because Hashem doesn't want to give this low life credit. Because they gave her a blessing, she was barren for many years. So some people say, if it doesn't help, it doesn't damage. No, no, my friend. If it doesn't help, it can definitely make a damage. Going to a fake Baba, put parsley here, put garlic in your nostrils, put in a jar staff of $100 bills, I give you maximum three months, you'll have twins. Three months became 30 years. The twins somehow not showing up. Of course, then when you want the money back, you're never going to be able to reach him on the phone anymore. You know, all these crooks. So what do we see? That she actually suffered because of the blessing of the crooks. Of Lavan, the crook, and his father. This is what some people think. Ah, I'll go to this faker. If it helps, it helps. If it doesn't help, I will, I will stay the same way. No, no. Hashem was planning to give you a child in three months. That was his original plan. But now when you counted on that faker, Hashem added five more years to your decree. You count on him, let him give you a child. Same thing with the army. When the army does good things, we should have gratitude. No contradiction. We admire what you do. We thank you very much. But for one second, we're not allowed to think that our life is in your hand. That's heresy. Shem uses you just like you use five million other things. You know, I mean, you know, I love this Dvar Torah. It's worth endless amount. David HaMelech said to the Goim, we say it in Halel, in Rosh Chodesh, in Hanukkah, in the holidays, 
שבחו את השם כל גויים, הללונה. דוד said to the גויים, praise השם. Why? Praise השם for what? כי גבר עלינו חסדו ואמת השם לעולם, הללויה. Praise God for saving us, the Jews, from your evil plans. Did you ever hear such a joke? <laughs> I called out to the Hamas, Mustafa, Ahmed, Isma. <laughs> Listen, what? I want you all to start singing to the God of Israel. For what? For saving us from your evil plans. They're going to say, leave this Jew alone, he lost his mind. <laughs> yalla, yalla. <laughs> Bara. Right or wrong? I won't even waste time on you. They'll make fun. Look at the Jew. He comes to tell us to sing to God that he saves them from our hand. So what, what's going on with David? David didn't know that. Why he writes in Tehilim to the Goim, to all the nations, praise God for what? That he's saving us again and again and again from your evil malicious plans. What's the secret? <laughs> we, we, as much as we see miracles, we don't even see 1% of the real picture. We only see what happened in the end. 10 died, 20 died, 1200 died. We didn't see the original plan. I heard that it was supposed to be Iran and Syria and Lebanon and Hezbollah and ha- everyone together. But they came a few days earlier. Meaning, if all of them will attack in one shot, there could be 100,000 dead. We don't know it. We may find out later on, after the investigation, after the war will complete. But the Goim knows it. The Goim knew what they could have done, and how every plan they made, almost everything went down the drain. So David said to them, come on, be honest. How can you not praise God for saving his children from your monster evil eyes, evil hands? You, you, you are the best testimony how much God is saving the Jews from your hand. So at least be honest after you fail in your plan to praise God for watching his children from your, from your hands. Will they do it? Probably not. But David makes a point. The point is not for them. The point is for us. When we read it in the Alel, we're supposed to think, wow, who knows what else we are being saved from those monsters every day and we have no idea what. One day when Mashiach comes and everything will be revealed, do you know how many billions and trillions of miracles we will find out that Hashem did to us which we had no idea about? I will, I will tell you one of them. You know when Saddam Hussein shot 39 SCAD missiles at Israel in the Gulf War? George Bush, the father, was the president. Some of you were not even born then. He actually shot 60 SCAD missiles in Israel. 60. 21 fell in the water, in the ocean. And 39 hit the ground of Israel. And now one person died. Miracle beyond any understanding. One person died from a heart attack. Who? Person that came with a scooter to Bnei Brak, next to the house of Rav Chaim Kanievsky on Shabbat, with full volume music. He came to disturb the religious rabbis of Bnei Brak on Shabbat. And then they took him to Rav Chaim, and Rav Chaim said to him, you're playing with fire. Because after they tried in a nice way, they didn't care. Rav Chaim said to him, just, I want you just to know that you play with fire. And right there, he got a heart attack and died. But no one died from the missiles. Direct, the missiles knocked down 50,000 apartments, got damaged. Now one person died. One missile was shot in a military base in Saudi Arabia, American military. More than 120 American soldiers died. One missile in the middle of nowhere, in the desert. Not in a crowded cities like Israel. In the middle of nowhere. Boom! On the head of the Americans, 120 dead. 
39 hit the ground in Israel, now one dead. But that's not a miracle yet. That's just the introduction to the real miracle. What was the biggest miracle? In Israel, they built a new gas central station in the middle of Israel, near Tel Aviv. A new one, state of the art. They wanted to shut the main faucet of the gas of the old place and move everything to the new place. It's computerized, it's more advanced. But the workers refused to move. It wasn't such a convenient location for them. Transportation, this, they got used to the old place. So for 10 years they've been fighting. They refused to move. The management, the government, move to the new place. The place is standing 10 years. We invested hundreds of millions in a new place. It's supposed to supply gas to half of Israel. Tel Aviv, Natanya, Kfar Saba, Bat Yam, Chulon. Cities with hundreds of thousands of people each city. Gas. Gas. I have to tell you what gas can do if you, if, if you turn the, the fire on. What will happen in all the pipes. So finally, they agreed to move. And the next few days after, one of the SCUD missiles hit directly on the main tank of gas. If they would, would not move, more than a million Israelis will be burned alive and the damage will be hundreds of billions of dollars. That will be the end of Israel. If they would stay another week with the gas open in the old place, that will be the end of Israel. How many people know about it? Not even 1% of Israelis. Most Israelis don't know about that miracle. Now I want to ask you a question. Why this miracle is less than the 10 plagues in, on Egypt? Why is it less? Yes, it's hidden. It looks like coincidence. It covers with nature. But it's just as, bad, as big. A million people just got saved from death. Or when the Arab threw rocks in Chola Moed Sukkot, close to 30 years ago, you look at the floor of the Western Wall, you couldn't, you couldn't see floor. All you saw is rock size of a melon. 100,000 rocks. They threw it from the top. Do you know a, a rock size of a melon fall from there on, and when there are 20,000 people, men, women, children, all like sardines in Chola Moed? And you see the video. You see the video how a flood of rocks are falling. Thousands by the second. Thousands. It should have been minimum 5,000 dead. Minimum. Maybe 10 even. There's, people started to run. Kids are falling. Old people falling on the floor. People step on each other's head. That alone. People can choke. Look what happened in Meron. Now one person died. Few minor injuries, that's it. You look at the floor, you cannot believe it. There was nowhere to run. Rocks are falling on your head. You can't move like sardine. You know, 20,000 people in a, in a hotel, there's nowhere to move. Five minutes before, there was Birkat Kohanim. 150 Kohanim. Yevarech Echa, Shem Vishmerecha. You see them. You see the video. Rabbi Uri Zohar Zatzal brought it in his, in his videotape. He made a lecture about it. What the Arabs didn't take to consideration? To do it ten minutes earlier. Because they did it five minutes after 150 Kohanim with the Talitot. Yevarechecha, Hashem v'ishmerecha. And Hashem shamar otanu. Such miracle. So miracles like this, I can tell you by thousands. But we're not impressed. Why? Because we are so impure, so tmeim, that we fall into this verse, and naim laem velo iru. We have eyes, but we cannot see. You have eyes and you can see. Sometimes you have two Jews. 
One see and the other one is blind. One see and the other one is blind. We have to pray for, to Hashem to give us spiritual pure eyes. The Ramchal say that there are two kinds of people. The first kind, a person that lives in a darkness. The second kind is a person that lives in a darkness. So why it's two kind? He lives in a Reuven lives in a darkness. Shimon lives in a darkness. He's talking spiritual darkness. He has no idea what he lives for. So why you consider them as two? Because Shimon just found out today that he lives in a darkness. And Reuven still does not know it. Now it's a whole different game ball. Ball game. Ball game. A whole different ball game. Why? Because right now somebody found out that he's in the wrong direction. He's going to start adjusting and fixing. The other one still continue in the wrong direction. There's no idea. I once gave an example, if you remember, in my series, Way of Hashem. I gave an ex- Actually, you know, it was the psychology of the mind with Rav Hoffman. It's a wonderful uh, series. You must listen to it and watch it. I made two of them, one about Shiduchim, but the first one. So Rav Hoffman asked, you have two people. One has to go from the south to the north, and the other one has to go from the south to the north. Both of them went to the opposite highway. And from south, instead from south to north, they go from north to south. They are going to the opposite direction. One is an hour ahead. One is almost in Be'er Sheva. Another hour will be in Elat. The other one is in Ashkelon. Another 40 minutes he will get to Be'er Sheva, so he's about an hour behind. The one that is almost close to Elat just found out that he's heading to the wrong direction. He made a U-turn and went to the opposite side of the highway and now he's heading north. He has to go all the way to north, to Haifa. Now, the other guy, the second guy, is now arriving to Be'er Sheva. He is almost in Elat. Who is closer to the target physically? Who is closer to Haifa? Someone that is in Be'er Sheva or someone that is in Elat? Be'er Sheva, it's at least an hour closer. But Rav Hoffman say, no. It's in the name of Rabbeinu Yonah. The one that is in Elat is much closer to Haifa than the one who is heading towards Elat. Even though right now, physically, if you measure, yes, it's closer, but he's heading to the opposite direction. The one that found out that I was in the opposite direction now is already on the way to the target. If both of them will die now, that second, who is closer to the target? The second one, no, the one that made the U-turn. How does Hashem will look at them? You were on your way to me and you were on the way away from me. Doesn't matter the distance. You were falling and he was rising. Even though right now he's falling from the 100th floor, he's right now in the 50th floor. Another minute he will hit the ground. But you are rising from zero to the, to the tenth floor. You by the tenth floor, he's by the fiftieth floor. He's higher than you spiritually. But he's on the way to crash in the bottom. And you are on the way. It's just a matter of time. Every fool is understand that. We don't care right now where you are. We care where you're heading to. And that's the machloket between the Rambam and Rabbeinu Yonah. It's a very important machloket. Critical for our Olam Abba, for our next world. The Rambam says, you are a wicked Jew, you have to repent fully. As it's written, Veshavta 
עד השם אלוקיך ושמעת בקולו. You have to return all the way to your God and he listen, listen to his instructions. But why does the Torah have to say עד השם אלוקיך? What for? ושבתה להשם אלוקיך. What does it mean? עד. עד means all the way to the destination. The Ramban say, if the repentance is incomplete, it's incomplete. It's not a full repentance. It's a repentance with defect. Rabbeinu Yona, on the other hand, say, no. He has a very beautiful expression. It's called, Mityatsev al darke ha-tshuva. Entered the path to repentance. That's already a huge thing. Because if you die on the way and you did not reach the destination, you are anus. Anus. Anus Rachmana Patre. Since you were heading to the right destination and you died in the middle, or they closed the road, the rest is not in your hand. It counts like you did it. Because you were heading there. I didn't, miss, I didn't make it. But I was on the way there. Do you understand now what's going on here? Rambam say, too bad. You should have woken up a, a, a year before. By then you will make it. You woke up when you're 60. You didn't make it by 875 when you died. It wasn't enough 15 years to fix all your mistakes. Rabbeinu Yonah say, the mercy of Hashem is that if he saw that you became really serious and you're heading to the right de- destination and you did not finish the mission, Hashem will count it for you like you did it. And that's what he say, Abba litaer mesayim, mesayim lo. This is what Hashem say, Ptach li petach kepitcho shel machad, veftach lecha kepitcho shel ulam. Open me an entrance. Size of a needle. Size of a needle is what? It's very, very small hole. You can barely fit anything there. But you already opened. I will open you like ulam. Like a huge entrance to me. First, you're going to make the first step towards me. And I will take care of almost everything else. Show me you want. And that's what happened to a lot of people that they give up on a tshuva because they are desperate. They say, ah, come on, Rabbi, I 40 years did the worst thing you can imagine. Where will I even start to fix what I've done? You know how many people I kill? You know how much money I stole? You know how much this and how much that? Where, where will I even start fixing? What they don't understand is, by Hashem, you don't have to complete necessarily the mission. You have to show that that's your goal. And if you did not succeed and it's not your fault because of different reasons, because Hashem took you out of the world early, you didn't make it. Or maybe your brain is not so sharp, so you don't understand so much Torah. You try, you try, you try, after 20 years you're still uh, Amaretz. Because your memory doesn't work. Why your memory doesn't work? Because you smoke grass for five years. It burns all your brain cell. You can focus. You can sit five minutes on a chair. What happened? Calm down. Rabbi, I have, uh, what's the name of it? ADD. All these words, ADD, FBI, <laughs> ADD. HDHD, whatever, they have all these words. Are we still good with the... Huh? You look concerned. You know, when I see you worry, I'm becoming double worry. Half full. full, so we're good. You know what they say in Israel. When someone tells you don't worry, begin to worry. When people say, Al tida, kvod arav. Oh, I just started to worry. <laughs> you know, there is this worm, what's the name of it? Caterpillar? So the worm has many, many, like I think 24 legs. Set, 12 sets of two. So one time a cockroach met that long worm and he said to the long worm, 
Wow, how do you have such unbelievable coordination? I have four legs and I can barely walk straight. How do you move 24? An hour later, the cockroach came and you see the worms is upside down. The legs are all confused. And he said, what, what happened to you? He said, from the minute you asked me how I'm doing it, I started to get confused. <laughs> Until now, it was walking smooth. Now when I started to think how to do it, it got all messed up. This is to all these wise guys. Rabbi, I need to understand why I do this mitzvah. No, you don't have to understand. Shem said to do it, do it. Once you do it, learn. No, I don't do anything unless I understand first why. So one time a guy told me that I can only do things that make sense to me in common sense. Egyoni, egyoni, logical. I say to him, when you go to the doctor and he tells you you have to go to an operation or to an MRI or you have to take pills three times a day. I never saw any patient who said to the doctor, I will only do what you tell me after I will understand how it works. Oh yeah, so go to medical school seven years. By the time you understand how it works, you'll be dead three times already. Ah, when it comes to the doctor, I don't have to understand how it works. I count on his advice. Why? He went to medical school. He's supposed to know, no? Same thing my accountant. Do this, don't do that. Deposit, don't deposit. This you can declare, this one you can't. Why you count on him? Because you don't know anything about accounting. <sighs> do you get the point or no? But when it comes to Torah, no, I have to first understand. Why? Yet, of course, the Satan gives you this advice. Don't agree to do. The rabbi is fooling you. Don't believe. He has a hidden agenda. He wants to kidnap you. To put you in his cult. In his cut. Rabotai... Listen carefully, Rabotai. Why Rivka had a relief when Shem told her that she has two boys? Remember what I asked you a minute ago? Or an hour ago, I should say? What's worse, to know you have one son, Rav Ovadia, and the other one, Bernie Sanders, or to have two modern Orthodox boys? Meaning they keep mitzvot, but they're nothing special. What's better? Which one of the two options you would choose? One hand, you have a son that liked the world with his Torah. Everyone admire him. Look how many books, how many alacho. Wow, revolution. Then you have a son, Bernie Sander, the communist trader. Every normal Jew cares him from morning to night. Hates Israel, loves Hamas. A self-hated Jew. That made a huge damage. He tried to convince Congress not to help Israel. To help Hamas, but not to help Israel. Traders from among us. Imagine if he was your son. Now you, might, you may say, I take the bad with the good. At least I focus on the good. Someone say, well, why don't you focus on the bad? You have one son that saved the world and the other son destroyed the world. Isn't it better to have two that do not damage the world at least? Yeah, but they don't help the world. Barely. It's a very hard question. But with Rivka, the answer was given. When she found out there are two boys, one Sadiq, one Rasha, she had a relief. What does the Torah wants to teach us? Better to have two kids, one Sadiq, one Rasha, than to have one kid that is half and half. Tiny quarter on his head. Yamaka. Jeans, sandals, holes in the jeans. Coming to Shachrit. Shachrit started at 7, shows up 7.40. Why? Because he's a Kohen. Birkat <laughs> Kohanim in a minute. And the Shul noticed that he's not there because he needs to do Eva Rechecha Hashem. 
And he came, he did Birkat Kohanim, put the tefillin, Shema Yisrael, Chatsi of the tefillat Shmona Yisrael barely, and Alenu Leshabach is already on the train to Manhattan. Why? The last thing he cared about is davening. He just came to show his face. He's voting Democrats. He's pro-gay marriage. He's pro-abortion. He's pro-Palestinian. Do you know a religious Jew that, that, that votes for Democrats? How can it be? You vote Democrats? You know what it means Democrat today? Like merits. You know merits in Israel? They want to marry men with men. They're pro-abortion. They want to kill all babies that are not wanted. They are pro-Hamas. They are pro-closing all the yeshivot and all the synagogues and the mikvehs. Those are the Democrats of today. Some of them are Muslim Nazis, Shakira, whatever, all their names. Slowly, slowly, the, the Democrats from being Jews, communist Jews, they became Arabs. Pro-Islam, terrible, dangerous people. Why would Jews vote for them? Because they have zero brain. Someone that has a brain will vote for someone that calls for his death, for the death of his state, for murdering millions of babies, for marrying men with men, for destroying everything valuable that the world had to offer. Don't get me wrong, not that the Republicans are a lot better. They're also wicked. It's a lot of corrupted politicians, it's business, gun control, uh, all kinds of things. Medicine, Medicare, lots of corruption, we know. Lots of corruption. But at least they are less wicked. They're not pro-abortion, they're not pro-Hamas. They're not pro-gay marriage, they're not pro-abomination. They have a little bit more values. So when you have, when you have someone that is 50% wicked or someone that is 90% wicked, and you have to take one of them with you on a trip, who are you going to take? You have to settle for the 50%. Must take one of them. Why would you vote for someone that is double wicked, that hate Torah? At least the Republicans are not enemies of the religion. They believe in God, they respect religion, they don't want to destroy the religion. They never declare, help us to wipe out religion, to close synagogues, to close churches, to destroy anything that religion has to say. You don't see it. But the Democrats in Israel and here, wow, Bernie Sanders, it was up to him. He would burn the yeshivot. He would burn Israel. What do you want more than that? So, Rivka had a relief. She found out she doesn't have a modern faker. Open orthodoxy. I would like to invite Pastor Kelly to my community in Boca Raton to give us a motivational speech from all the rabbis in the world that are holy and righteous and Talmidei Chachamim. None of them is worthy to come speak to your congregation to give words of encouragement. You need a Christian missionary Nazi to come, an admirer of Hitler that says we have to pray for his soul, an admirer of JC that wants to convert all Jews to Christianity, this is who you bring to stand next to the Torah? That shul had to be closed that minute. The congregation had to shut the door. We never step here ever again. I heard now, yesterday I heard Rabbi Feldman, the Rosh Yeshiva at Ner Israel, Baltimore. Baltimore. Ner Israel is an important yeshiva. He first agreed to the demonstration in Washington. You know, they gathered 290,000 Jews to go to Washington. So, first he agreed. They asked him, Rabbi, should we go? He said, yes. But he said, I want to know who is going to speak there. But the organizer, some reforming, they did not say it until the last day. They kept asking them, who, what's the schedule? Who is going to speak there to our Jews, to my student? So Bachurei Yeshiva is going to be there. He didn't know there's going to be women singing. Obviously, they didn't say that. They said, don't worry. We know the needs of the Orthodox people. 
we will make the demonstration suitable to all kinds of Jews. And a, a, a demonstration of unity, you know, all kinds of bombastic words. So, the day of the demonstration, or the day before, you have to see his letter, I'm not sure. I think it was one day before, or maybe in the morning of the same day. They just announced that there will be a Christian, huge supporter of Israel. Some political leader, Christian, some kind of a pastor, evangelical uh, pastor. That is a youth supporter of Israel. Is going to speak in a demonstration against the Hamas and for the sake of Israel. What do you want? It's great. We want some going to support us. But we have halacha. You're not allowed to listen to these people. They are idol worshippers. Even if they are in love with Israel. Even if they will donate a billion dollars a day to Israel. Are you allowed to bring them in front of a Jewish audience to speak? You have to die and not to agree. To put an idol worshipper to speak to Jewish community. To bring him into your synagogue as the rabbi of the synagogue, there's no bigger criminal than you ever. And he still speak and write a column for the, what's the magazine? The name of them. Ami, whatever, one of them. Still write weekly column there. I don't know, I don't bring this filth into my house. You have to be super stupid to bring this so-called religious magazines into your house. You know the damage it caused with the, with the right ideology they spread? Just the pictures of all their advertisement is so goyish. How many Hasidim it made goes off the, off the, off the derech? Naive, innocent Hasidim that were holy became hungry for vacations, for horrible Passover here and Cancun and Florida, apartments with all kinds of luxury. Well, since when? They had, these people were very all into Torah and simple lifestyle with the tradition of their fathers for decades. Why you turn them to 50-60% goyim? This is the magazine they bring into the house. You know, this, uh, this, this holy woman, very famous. I don't want to say her name. I don't want to get her into trouble. But she's a very important woman in the community. She told me once that she called to one of these magazines who called themselves religious, right? That all the foam people brings into the house for Shabbos. She asked them, can I ask a question? Yeah. Who is your mashgiach? Who is your rabbinical authority? Do you have a rabbi that supervises what you publish? Do you know, she said, do you know how angry they got at me? I was so nasty that I'm asking such a question. I said, okay, you can get angry at me. Give me a name. Do you have a rabbi that you ask him what to do, what not to do? you have that Torah? Of course not. What normal rabbi will give authority to such a field? What rabbi will agree to put all kinds of terrible articles which is all against Jewish ashkafa? Yadi, the Israeli general, the prime minister, interview with some Mechalel Shabbat or Chel Lobsters. Why are you putting him in a kosher magazine? You normal? Why do you even put his face? You're not allowed to look at his face according to the Torah. Can't look at their face. When Netanyahu speaks, you're not supposed to look in his face. Any one of the members of the government almost is Mechalel Shabbat. From a, now it's Actually, more than ever, you have Shomrei Shabbat. There never been so many Shomrei Shabbat in a Knesset like now. But you still have close to 80 Mechalelei Shabbat there and Goim. You have gays there. You have people who hate Torah. You have supporters of Hamas. You have Arab terrorists there. Muslim brothers. It's a lot of enemies of God inside the Knesset. But even those who respect the religion, like the chairman of the house, He's a raidi. He loves religion. He came from a Moroccan traditional family. His grandfather was a rabbi in Morocco. But he lives with a man, openly. He came with him to the inauguration, hand with hand. 
And all the religious ministers in the Knesset have to call him Mr. Chairman. Hashem is pleased with that? It's Sodom and Gomorrah. That's why we're dying. That's why we are dying. You don't have to believe me. Read the Tanakh. Read the words of the prophets. They explain why the tragedies happen. Every one of their explanation happened to us as we speak. So what changed? It's the same God and the same opinion. The same Ashkafa, the same ideology. What has changed? Nothing has changed. We continue to die for our stupidity. For our ignorance and for our wicked way. And then when someone get up and scream, they target him as fanatic, extreme. I said, if Moshe Rabbeinu would come today for a lecture tour, how many congregations will allow him to speak? One out of a hundred. What about the other 99? The board would vote against him. It's, it's crazy. It's vile. It's radical. It's extreme. It's dangerous. It's fanatic. He promotes hate. He said to kill Amalek. He said to kill Mechalele Shabbat, to kill gays. How do you let such a rabbi into the community? You normal? Forget Moshe Rabbeinu. Every one of the Tanaim in Gemara, they will put them in Kherem. If Rabbi Akiva will make Kashrut, they will put all the other modern Orthodox Kashruyot, the, the Kashruyot that the Hasidim don't trust. That kind of Kashruyot would put a ban against the Kashrut of Rabbi Akiva. They will say it's a Baal Tshuva. Baal Tshuva is fanatic, it's extreme. Rabbi Akiva is not loyal. We cannot eat his meat. <laughs> I have a friend. He's a Baal Tshuva for 40 years. One of the first ones. Israeli came to America, married an American doctor. So at one time he was in a yeshiva for Baal Tshuva, Americans, because he speaks very good English, intelligent guy. <laughs> So they sent him for Shabbat to a house of a family. Somewhere in Monsi, I believe it was. Or Brooklyn, maybe. I don't remember. So they gave him a wine to do Kiddush. You know, by the Ashkenazim, everyone does Kiddush for himself. By the Sfaradim, the head of the household, he does Kiddush. Monsi, everyone lead a Chova. Ashkenazim, some of them wants to make Kiddush for themselves, for the wife. Even though there are few families, each one does Kiddush for himself. Either way is good. So they gave him a bottle of wine to do Kiddush. He's a new Baal Tshuva, six months. You know, but first Baal Tshuva, they don't know Alachot. So they don't want to take risk. They told him this Kashrut is not reliable for wine. He looked at the Kashrut. He said, I'm sorry, I can't use this bottle. All the people in the family, why? What's wrong with the bottle? They told me in Yeshiva that this uh, kashrut is not reliable. He, saw, he told me the story. He told me, I saw, they almost dropped dead. They became red. They were looking at each other. They're looking in the, the head of the house. He doesn't know where to hide. I realized I said something very dangerous here. But what do I know from my life? They told me over there in yeshiva, you cannot trust them, they're too modern. In the end, he found out that the head of that organization was this man. <laughs> <laughs> now why do you think Hashem sent that Baal Tshuva Ashkenazi to the house of that family that this incident will happen in his table. What do you think? It's coincidence? Use your head. Why? There are thousands of families. Why did he end in the house of that person? To tell him the truth in his face to this faker. Wake up. Enough. With your half enough. This is what Rivka was worried about. Half religious, half professor in Harvard. Half Hasidish, Half a judge in Manhattan criminal court wearing a shaitel. That's what she's worried about. She's 
if the shaitan is tzanua or not. She's sending people to death with their verdicts, Jews and goyim against Hashem, against the Torah every day in a job. Because it's Sodom and Gomorrah, you have to follow the rules. You cannot follow the rules of Hashem. So it happened to be that at least once a week or twice or ten times, I don't know how many cases she has, she has to send innocent people to prison or to release monsters to the street. Why? Because Hussein Obama wants to compliment such a rasha. What happened if two men would come and fight for the inheritance? We married. I'm entitled to get rights. She has to decide based on the rules of New York. She will have to declare that Jimmy and Isaac have to split because they are husband and husband. And right there, she loses her olam abba. You giving rights to two men who are married? In my world? When Hashem created Adam, He put him in a garden of Eden with unbelievable trees. Paradise. Do you know what's the first sentence Hashem said to Adam Arishon? The Midrash brings it. You know what Hashem told him? First thing. Ten da'atcha shelo tachriv et olami. I'm warning you. Do not dare to damage my world. And a minute later he did it. He put him to be a keeper of the gardens. Read in the Bereshit, Parashat Bereshit. He has to take care of the garden. First thing Hashem told him, make sure, pay attention, do not damage my world. And since then until now, all we do is damaging his world. Why we damage his world? We have foreign influences on us. University, high school, public school, parents, horrible teachers, terrible newspapers, horrible media, bad friends, and the worst, heretic speakers on YouTube. Santa Claus and his friends. Massive damage to millions of souls. Daily damage. There are some fools who drive in a car and listening to Santa, thinking, wow, so inspiring. They don't know that every second is a huge sin against Hashem. Someone that writes a book to declare a war against Hashem. How do you define such a person? Don't tell me what to do. You were alone. You were needy. You needed me. I didn't ask to come to the world. You have no right to tell me what to do and you can definitely not judge me. I have no reason to apologize to you. You have to apologize to me. You have no right to punish. You are a needy. A woman's beauty is not private. She has to flesh it to the world. Didn't you read 5,000 times in the Gemara that it's the biggest sin for a woman to show herself in public? Don't you see that that's the worst thing that brings all the tragedies to the Jewish nation? Who nominates your filthy mouth to write such a thing in a book and sell it? And who published the book? New York Times of Israel. Why not? You know, the biggest, most wicked newspaper in the history of Israel. Lefty Liberals Anti-Religion Edition. They published this filthy book. And how many people with beards and hats here are buying his books and listening to his garbage daily? Their ashkafa is beyond terrible. Below terrible. You know, I want to tell you a few months ago, here, Simantov can be a witness. We finished the lecture here. We wanted to go eat something. It was around, I don't know, 1 a.m. We wanted to go to a restaurant here in Coney Island that opened at night. We, got, we came to the place. It's never been so packed. Usually we come there, we have five people there. Baruch Hashem, quiet, nobody recognizes us. We came to the place, I don't know, 12.30, remember that day? There was 200 people in a restaurant. There's no chairs. 
I said, what's going on here? No, what's going on here? You know this guy, uh, Jonathan Ben Shimol, who interviews the rabbi? He made a few interviews with me as well. He was there with another rabbi. They just were on the way out. I asked him, Jonathan, what's happening here? He said, there was a show here. A show. I said, what show? Comedy. Comedy. Who was the comedian? Moody, Modi. Who is this Modi? A filthy gay that lives with a man, make jokes against religion and rabbis, and brag, brag, that he's openly a gay and live with a man, married to a man. According to the Torah, you're allowed to look at his face? It's a sin to look at his face. It's a sin to stand next to him, to shake his hand. It's against God. I didn't write the rules. Don't blame me. Don't say I'm an extremist. Don't say anything. I'm nothing. I'm just reading. You're allowed to go to a show of such a place, a person? I ask him how, how people went to this show. I thought the people are, I see everyone is religious here. How did they go to that show? You're not allowed to stand next to this guy. You can't look in his face. Can I mention his name, Bechlal? He's against every halacha book. What broke my heart is that he had people in their late 50s and 60s with black hats and beards. And that's how I know it's the end of us. That's it. We are finished. If people who is to go to yeshivot, they go to the show of this Rasha Merusha clown, <laughs> why he imitate some people? It just show how empty we are. And then we laugh at the chilonim. <laughs> we laugh at the chilonim. We are worse than them. They didn't go to yeshivot. Anyone more the chilonim, who to see, who not to see? What's kosher, what's not kosher? The chilonim can tell the difference between a kosher person to a non-kosher? No. They have no guidelines. They were not raised as human beings. They were raised as another species in nature. Achol ki machar namut. Enjoy the moment, because you're about to die. That's their motto in life. They have no gut feeling. They don't know about Musar. They don't know anything. They have no idea. They eat whatever they see. They become intimate with whatever they see. They have no purpose, no direction, no nothing. Zero ideology. The Chilonim have zero Ashkafa, zero. They don't know one thing about anything in the world. Nothing. Every decision they make is against Hashem. Check. Don't have to believe me. See what they write in the newspaper. Hard to believe. Well, you would think that by now a lot of these lefties, after the Arabs butcher them, they will already get the point. Still demonstrate in Tel Aviv for Hamas. You believe such thing? Hamas killed two-thirds of the people that die are lefty extremists. People like Bernie Sanders, around 800 Bernie Sanders were murdered in this attack. 800 feet like this guy who wants Hamas, who, pro -pro, who support them, who support gay parties, who support closing the yeshivot and destroying the yeshivot who support destroying Judaism. This the people from the kibbutzim. They would drive the Palestinian murderers to Israeli hospitals daily, back and forth. One of them was sitting with Arafat drinking coffee. Arafat is in love with her. She does the job for this Nazi. And they murdered her. And now they just announced that one of the biggest lefty traders was shot by them. It's unbelievable. I gave my life for you, Ahmed. Why you shoot me in the head? I help you more than the entire Hamas organization. Thanks to me, you're sitting in Gush Katif. Thanks to me, you kicked all the Jews out of the home and broke the synagogues. Thanks to me, you got hundreds of acres of land. We kicked the Jews out of the home and gave you the land. Why are you killing me? You have to kiss my feet. I'm a liberal lefty trader. I gave my life for you. Boom. Bullet to the head. You're a Jew. That's it.
They're not getting the point. Some of them woke up. And it's only for two, three months. One of the ways of the Satan is to make everyone forget. Forgetfulness. Forget, 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 forget. Once in a while, Hashem sends us a slap to remind us. We remember for a day and we forget again. So I started to explain, Achashverosh came to all the rabbis, what should I do with Vashti? The rabbis knew, it's a no-win situation. Whatever we say, we're going to get into trouble. One day he missed Vashti, because of us he killed her. If we tell him, no, don't kill her, he's going to blame us for making him look bad. They found him an excuse. Since the Bet HaMikdash was destroyed, Hashem took away our vision, prophecy, we can't see. We can't, we can't. He got rid of it. But this Vashti, this Vashti, she was righteous or wicked? Very wicked. A wicked Vashti, she made a party, women only. No mixed dancing. Vashti, the Nazi Vashti, who used to torture Jewish girls and make them work on Shabbat. She would never dare to make a party men and women together. Today one person called me, a woman, that her daughter is getting married. Who is she getting married? To a guy that based on the stories is not such a bargain. And the guy refused to do a kosher wedding. Wants to do mix. They're going back and forth, arguments. I told her, you're not allowed to give a penny to that wedding. But it's my daughter, I don't know what to do. I said, you have to decide who comes first, your daughter or Hashem. This is your test now. Tell them, if you're going to make the wedding according to God's halacha, whatever I have to pay, I pay. If you will turn it into Moshav Letzim and uh, rebelling, rebelling against Hashem, mixed dancing, goish dance, music, all kinds of people not modest, not only I don't give money for that, I myself won't show up. So she told them that. So what did they answer? Okay, so we don't need a wedding. We're going to make a little kiddush. She got nervous. I said, what do you got nervous? You should be dancing. Thanks to you, horrible crime against Hashem is about to be prevented. But women, they think with the heart, not with the head. And this woman, unlike most women, she thinks with the head. But the heart still hurt. I told her, you, you should be lucky. She said, yeah, but what? it's my, my daughter's wedding, I'm going to have a little kiddush. So what's better? To make a wedding for 500 people, boys and girls, touching each other, kissing, dancing, putting goish music and eat without brachot? She knows the truth. So I said, offer them to pay for the whole thing, but only in one condition. Uh, you do it the right way. So now they agree for one hour to put mechitza. But what's going to be after? Put down the mechitza and turn it into a nightclub. Also not kosher. See, one rabbi went to be mesader kiddushin in a wedding. Of chilonim, not chilonim, modern orthodox. Very open modern orthodox. And he saw that they are dying for him to leave. Rabbi, don't you have what to do? <laughs> don't you have a lecture tonight, Rabbi? He said, his assistant said to him, why are you staying here? It's not a kosher wedding. You did the chupa, you finished the ktuba, go. So I'm staying here all night. Why? He said, I know why they want me to leave. As soon as I leave, they knock down the mechitza and, and turn it into a disco place. I will have to stand here and watch and guard them for not losing their olam haba and not losing the blessing of their marriage. Do you think that one husband and one wife who got married in a mixed goish wedding, do you think they will ever have blessing in their life? You are dreaming. Dreaming! 
You have zero understanding how Hashem runs the world. You never read the Torah. If you read the Torah, you would know it's impossible to ever see blessing in your marriage and raising children if you get married in a mixed dancing. Never. It's over for you. You will never have blessing. No exaggeration. It's a clear verse in the Torah. And I want to remind you, I did not write the Torah and Hashem did not consult with me. I'm not guilty. It's written in the Torah, V'aya machanecha kadosh. Everywhere you reside, have to be holy. V'aya machanecha kadosh. V'aya machanecha kadosh. And what does it say? V'ra'a b'cha ervat davar. If I will see, Erva means a place that's supposed to be covered. Like the spies went to Israel to check Erva Ta'aretz, to check the hidden places, what's covered, to give us information because before we come to occupy the Holy Land. That's why we send spies to tell us what to do. Erva means a place that must be covered at all time. Women, body has to be covered below the elbows, below the, the knees. When they sit, the knees have to be covered. Nothing should be attached, no opening here, no opening in the back. There are rules, there are halachot. So the Torah says, If I see anyone, you have 500 people in a place, one woman is dressed openly against halacha, I, the Almighty God, cannot enter that wedding. Cannot enter there. Why? It's against, against my ideology. I cannot be together in a mixture of men and women when the women are not dressed. I will not be there. Some women, they light candle on Shabbat. Forty-five minutes. Short sleeves, open, short pants, <laughs> tight. You really, really dream that Hashem would even look at you with the way you dress? Especially when you come to pray for the life of your children? That's zero understanding how Torah works. Once you, once you were a naked woman walking in the street, you are the biggest criminal, Machtiat Arabim. There's nothing worse than that. Every man who looks at you, there is a new sin registered to your file. Could be million a day, million an hour. Million an hour. Do you know what, what does it mean to commit million sins in an hour? All you have to do is walk with tights and short things or, or sleeveless shirt in King's Highway in the summertime. One hour. One million sins already went to your account. The Gemara, in Masechet Sota, page 2, the Gemara says, Mezavgim lo la'adam zivug lefi ma'asav. A person gets his soulmate based on his behavior. Tell me who you are, I'll tell you who your wife's going to be. Now the Gemara elaborates. The Gemara say, Tznu'a la tzadik, prutza la rasha. Rashi brings it there. How Hashem makes matchmaking? He see a righteous Ben Torah, Tzadik, Yerushamayim, Talmid Chacham. He finds a great girl for him. Who is a great girl? A modest girl. What about all the other mitzvot? Not relevant. Not even mentioned. One thing I check, that's it. Tznu'a la Tzadik. Prutza la Rasha. Why not Tzadiket la Tzadik, Rashait la Rasha? By women, there's no such thing, a righteous, wicked. There's modest or prutza, that's it. Because that's already the majority of her mission in life. So if she's prutza, she fell guaranteed. She failed in her life. Why? Because it's not an individual sin. You break Shabbat, one sin. You eat not kosher, another sin. You spoke Lashon Ara, another sin. In your lifetime, you can accumulate few thousands or tens of thousands of sin. But it's individual sin. One, two, three, four, five. It adds up. Eventually, you reach a high number. 
But when you walk one hour, not madness, you're not a regular sinner. You promote crimes against Hashem. It's a whole different league. It's considered Machtiyat Arabim. Machtiyat Arabim. Like Santa and his friends, all these people in my black list, they are all Machtiyat Arabim. Every time someone listens to them, he will be punished. And they will be punished for every one of their views. They are happy. They see a lot of views on YouTube. They don't know what's waiting for them. Because the people that listen to them become heretics. They redesigned their Ashkafa. You have some innocent Hasidim. They went to good yeshivot, kosher yeshivot. They, go, they taught them good Ashkafa, good Musar. They're anti-communism, anti-wicked people, anti-Zionists. They're very much into modesty. They begin to listen to this clown. Three months later, they become heretics. They lost their Olam Abba. Who's going to pay for it? You will, you will. <laughs> Do you get the point or no? Tov, Rabotai, time is running out. And uh, we have five minutes left. Just one last thing for today and we finished. So remember what I've said. It took me two hours to explain it, but I think you got the point. Better to have one child tzaddik and one rasha than one that is half and half. The same thing, better not to know anything in Torah than to know half of every sugiah. Half true is worse than a complete lie. You know why? Because when you speak complete nonsense and lies, it's very fast people will detect that you're some kind of an ignorant fool. But when you know half, you can fool thousands of people. They actually admire you. Wow, he knows this, he knows that. They don't understand the danger of knowing only half of the sugiah. Just like a doctor who knows half of what he has to do in a brain surgery. And there is a doctor who is a podiatrist. He doesn't know anything about brain surgery. <laughs> I, t- I take care of nails on feet. No, no, you have to operate on my son's brain. Come on, he will be dead in a minute. So the one who knows nothing about brain is much better than someone who knows half. Because the one that knows half will kill the patients for sure. The one that knows nothing will not touch the patient. Do you get the point or no? They ask Rav Ezra Atiya. They ask him, what's the difference between a perfect Talmud Chacham to a not perfect Talmud Chacham? You know what it means, a not perfect Talmud Chacham? Someone who knows so much can give you hundreds of hours of speeches. He knows a lot. He knows Gmarot, he knows Alachot, he knows Musar. It's very entertaining. Rav Ezra Atiyah answered, it's like the difference between a human being to a monkey. In case you don't know who, was, who Rav Ezra Atiyah was, you can put him together with a Chazonish. The Ashkenazim had a giant Chacham, Chazonish. The Sfaradim had a giant Chacham, Ezra Atiyah, Zatzal. All the rabbis of the Sephardi world are his students from Torah Yosef. He was lion in Torah, in holiness, in Kedusha. Beyond words. And so down to earth, so humble. He is the rabbi of Rav Uvadi Yosef, of Rav Ben Zion Abba Shaul, of all the rabbanim, of Rav Ades. All the gdolei Sephardim came out of him. So I want to just finish. You know, sometimes Hashem brings hunger to the world. Nothing is going. No rain, hunger, no merchandise, no food to buy. We read it on Shabbat. There's hunger in the land. There was hunger in the time of Abraham. Now there is hunger in the time of Yitzchak. It's a pattern. Hashem used the same things. Let's see why. Chachamim say, 
י' שנות רעבון באו לעולם. Ten times hunger came to the world. One in a time of Adam. As it's written, ארורה אדמה בעבורך. The land is scarce for you. Meaning nothing will grow, you have to work very hard. טוב. Second one in a time of למך. And it's written, מן האדמה אשר ערערה השם. From the land that השם cursed. Third time. In the time of Abraham, as it's written, ויהי רעב בארץ. There was hunger in the land. Four times, in the time of Yitzchak, as it's written, ויהי רעב בארץ. The hunger in the time of Abraham, what, what number from all the hungers was the third one? Number three. So why does it say here in the Torah, מלבד הרעב הראשון אשר היה בימי אברהם. The hunger in the time of Abraham was the third hunger. But it's written, besides the first hunger that was in the time of Abraham. The answer, רבותיי, listen carefully, there are two kinds of hunger. One is a punishment for people's sin. And one is to test the tzaddikim. Two different purposes. The hunger in the time of Adam, in the time of Lemech, came because all the people were wicked and commit sins and crimes against God. As it's written, Arura Adama Ba'avurecha, because of you, I curse the land. And nothing will grow. Because of you, you are the cause of it. Because of you, people are dying. Because of you, terrorists burning people alive. Because of you, financial crash come to the land. That's when Hashem talked to the wicked people. Because of you, all these tragedies happen. From the, from the land that Hashem cursed. But the hunger in the time of Abraham was a completely different hunger. Why? This was one of the ten tests that Hashem gave to Avraham Avinu to see if he's worthy enough to pass the legacy of Hashem. Also in the time of Yitzchak. Now Hashem comes to test Yitzchak. So we have first two hungers because of sins. The second and the, the third and the fourth is 100% a test. For whom? For one tzaddik. That the whole world is on his shoulder. All I, all I care is about you. Nothing else matters. No. And it's written, ויהי רעב בארץ, מלבד הרעב הראשון אשרה בימי אברהם, וילך יצחק אל אבימלך גררה. He went to the king of Philistines. All the kings of Egypt, their name is Paro. One Paro, second Paro, third Paro. It wasn't their real name, it's a title. Same thing, the kings of Plishtim, all their names is Avimelech. One Avimelech, another Avimelech. It wasn't his real name. It's a title of a king. So, Rabotai, in the time of the hunger of Avraham Avinu, hundreds of thousands of people were starving for bread. There's nothing to eat. Why? For one reason, that Hashem wants to test Avraham. 500,000 people are hungry. What do they have to do with the test of Avraham? Nothing. They don't count like anything. All I care is about this tzaddik. Let's see if he's going to pass the test or not. Hundreds of thousands. You know how in a movie you have the main actor and everyone else is just standing there? They collect them from the street. Here, I'll give you 50 bucks. Stand over here. You eat your head. You pretend you drink coffee. What am I doing? Don't worry. Just talk. Pretend you have a meeting. We need a background. But nobody cares about all these people in the back. Everyone <laughs> focus on the main actor. That's the, mu- the movie about. <laughs> Everyone is for the sake of the story of that one individual. Who is... In the main stage, Avraham Avinu. And what is God's will by that? He wants everyone to go to Egypt because of the hunger. 
And then everyone will see that Sarah was taken to the house of the king of Egypt. And then everyone will see that Hashem will strike the king of Egypt with one of his angels. That will constantly beat them up all night. And the king of Egypt will come on his knees begging Abraham for mercy, returning his wife to Abraham and give him his daughter with tons of money and jewelry as compensation for torturing your wife for one night. Who did he give? Agar. It didn't work out for us. <laughs> Maybe it would be better it wouldn't happen, but I guess it was a part of the plan. So Agar say better for me to be a servant in a house of a legendary holy man than a princess in a house of a cursed nation. What do I do here? I be a princess of all the thorns. Why does it help me? After that, everyone started to admire Abraham in the world. So this whole hunger was for one purpose. Abraham is going to pass the test and I will elevate him to be the leader of the world. My personal representative. Just like Ephron told him, Nasi Elohim, Ata Betochenu. You are the representative, the president of God among us. Rabotai, I'm almost done. Now there is hunger again in the time of Yitzchak. The story repeats. Again, Hashem make thousands and thousands of people starving. For what? For what? That everyone will come to see how Yitzchak is getting a special status for the whole world to know. That's another holy person. And then later on in the time of Jacob, there will be another hunger. Avraham, Yitzchak, and everyone had to go through hunger. And thanks to that hunger, we went to Egypt. And thanks to Egypt, we got the Torah, and we had the miracles, and the Yetziat Mitzrayim. And thanks to that, we have all the mitzvot of the Torah. Almost every mitzvah is Zecher Litziat Mitzrayim. Tfilin, Zecher Litziat Mitzrayim. Tali, Tzitzit, Zecher Litziat Mitzrayim. Shabbat, Zecher Litziat Mitzrayim. Aleday, Zecher Litziat Mitzrayim. Pesach, Shavuot, so many mitzvot, Zecher Litziat Mitzrayim. Every mitzvah you can connect directly to the exodus of Egypt or indirectly. But everything linked to that moment. That Hashem took us out of slavery into freedom and gave us the Torah. Hayom hazen yet aleam. Today you became a nation. But we were a nation for many years in Egypt. A tortured nation, but a nation. No, no, no. Without the Torah you are nothing. You're not considered a nation. All the nations in the world, how they become a nation? They have a land. They have an anthem. They have a flag, they have an army, and they have a king or a government, they have language, and they have culture. That's what makes them into a nation. The Jewish nation has none of the above. If they have God and the Torah, they are a nation. Without it, they are nothing. That's what Hashem said. You're not like the rest of the world. Why? Jews can speak any language. There's no problem. It's still a nation. Yiddish. Yemenite, Persian, Ladino, all of them in one minyan. Same Kaddish, same Kedusha, same everything. Ah, so many languages. Well, what? What unites us, the Torah. Without the Torah, there's no Israel. Without the Torah, there's no eternal world. Without the Torah, you have no connection to Hashem. Without the Torah, you are worse than an animal. Where does it say it? Don't say, I say it. Gemara in Masechet Eruvin, page 100. Amar Rabbi Yochanan, Ilmale nitna Torah, Ainu lemedim derech eretz meachatul vemeatar negol. If we would have not received the Torah, 
We will have to learn how to behave from the cat and the rooster and the animals. Meaning, we would be worse than them. They will have to teach us civilization. What can you, te- what can you learn from a dog or from a cat? They go to the bathroom, they flash. Most people don't flash. Go in the airport, see how many people flash and how many don't. A cat and a dog always flash. They cover the waist with their back legs. Flash, flash the, the toilet. Not flash. <laughs> you should be used to my accent by now. After 20 years you come to my lecture. So they cover the waist with sand. Who told the cat to cover, or the dog? They go like this. They send a lot of sand to cover it. Who gave the dog such wisdom? The answer, Hashem. What do you learn from the rooster? The rooster is a wonderful husband. I wish all the ladies a husband that is a rooster like that. Not that he looks like a rooster, but behave like a rooster. What's special about the rooster? The rooster never forces intimacy on his female until she agrees and calls for it. Meaning, sometimes the husband comes home, you know, he already has two weeks, which is limited, mikve, this, nida, oh, two weeks a month. And he was on a business trip, he has two nights left. He come home, but his wife has a hundred and two fever. <laughs> Moshe, I prepared soup in the kitchen. Can you bring me some soup? I came to serve you now. Save me! I'm sorry, I don't feel good. He makes her feel horrible. Rabbi, it's hard as it is. She's not considerate. If it would be the other way around, I will agree even if I'm sick. He has a speech. Learn from the rooster. The rooster dance around the female. <laughs> Make her laugh. And then she say, come you fool. <laughs> <laughs> but there is one more difference between a male rooster to a female. You know what? Rav Ovadia Yosef Zatzal gave a beautiful mashal. And we finish with that. He said the rooster, the male rooster is the soul. The female is the body. What happens if you do not feed the male? You have rooster in your backyard. You don't throw wheat, barley. He walks all day. Next day, walk, walk, walk. Pop! He falls and dies. Why didn't you say anything, you fool? I would give you food. Walk, walk, walk. Except his death. The female, few hours you don't give her food. Quack, 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 quack. The Gemara says it's called Mehades. You know what Mehades? All the vase falls from the shelf. Chandelier is on the floor. The coffee is on a rug. Quack, quack. What happened? Oh, quickly, take, take. She hops. Rav Ovadi Yosef, the female is the body. The male is the soul. If you don't feed your body for six, seven hours, stomach grinding, I'm, I'm dizzy, I can't focus, give me food already, there's no time for lunch break. Come on, what kind of a job is this? I'm hungry. The body refused to cooperate without food. No water, no food, the body. What happened? I'm fasting today. Don't talk to me about learning. I learned until 1 p.m., that's it. Now I didn't have my coffee, headache, my stomach, I'm dizzy. If you don't feed your soul, 90 years, 90 years you learn like a liberal, communist, anti-God person. Never in your life you heard a speech, never you read Torah, you don't come to shul, definitely not to yeshiva. You live like another animal in nature. That's it, just to enjoy the moment. What happened to the soul doesn't make a beep, like the male rooster. The soul is dying, completely disconnected from Hashem, dead for 70, 80 years, now one beep. The body six hours, 
That's it, you finished. I won't move. You can walk, you can jump, you can, you can do anything. There is a verse about it. It's written in the book of Yechezkel. Hashem say, Chai Hashem, I swear on my name. It's the highest level of speech by God. There's no higher than that. Chai Hashem, Neum Hashem, the speech of God, the life of Hashem, meaning like I swear on my life. That's the highest, uh, highest level of promise. It's written in the book of Yechezkel. Chai Hashem, Ki lo achpotz bemot amet. I swear on my name, God say, that I'm not interested to kill the dead. How can you kill the dead? He's dead already. I'm not interested to kill the dead. I am interested that he should repent, that he should live. Fishav midarko ara'av achai. I want him to return from his wicked way that he should live. So when he's wicked and he's not righteous, how God call him? Dead. Why? He's walking, he's dancing, smiling, playing basketball, eating a steak, making money in the stock market or in real estate. What do you mean dead? He's alive. He has 5,000 employees. He's the President of the United States. From time to time he wakes up. Recently he's been awake since the war started. Maybe life was boring. We gave him some action. He's now very alert, Baruch Hashem. Just when we needed him to be awake. Imagine if you fall asleep like he used to. Baruch Hashem, now he's performing. From here you see that Hashem activates all leaders. It's written. It's written, Lev Melachim Beyad Hashem, Palge Maim, Palge Maim, no. What's the verse? I have to remember it. Huh? No, no. It's very interesting. The verse is half and half. Half of the verse say, the hearts of, Hashem, of the kings is in the hand of Hashem. Like, the path of the water. What's the connection between the water and the heart of the king? It looks like there's no connection between the beginning to the end of the verse. How did they used to bring water from the lake into their field? They used to dig a canal and the waters go based on how the canal takes them. The water choose where to go? No. The water are led by the person who dug the canal. Same thing, the, 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 the King Solomon writes, same thing, the kings do nothing on their own. Whatever Hashem activates them. Hussein Obama attack Israel. Biden, now it's the time to be pro-Israel. Just two months ago you were very much, you didn't even want to meet Netanyahu. Now we met him six times already in one month. Why? Hashem decided now it's the time to be a supporter. Two months, and we didn't need your support yet. So you see that the same person in one minute turned. Arik Sharon was an extreme right. Hashem wanted to punish us, give Gush Katif to these monsters, Hamas, turn the head of Arik Sharon from an extreme righty to an extreme lefty. The damage he made to Israel is more than any lefty prime minister. He gave the entire Gush Katif to the Hamas for nothing. A week ago, he, he was ready to destroy all of them, to wipe them out. A week later, he gave them and took Jews out of their home brutally, destroyed the life of thousands of Jews. Until today, they don't have a place to live. How a righty politician turned into Bernie Sanders overnight? Because Hashem decided. It's not in your hand. Nothing you can do. So it's written by the book of Yechezkel, and we finish for today. I swear that I'm not interested to kill the dead. All the warnings in the Torah, death penalty, Mechalel Shabbat, Mot Yumat. It's not because I want to kill him. He's already dead. He's disconnected from me. 
He has no connection to his father. His soul does not suck, does not receive the divine energy from me. The soul came out of me. It's a spark of me. But it's disconnected from the source. Like a phone is disconnected from a charger. Everybody knows the phone is dead, it's dying. It's just a matter of time. Once you reconnect, the light goes back and it comes back to, la- to life. So Hashem called the secular people dead. I'm not interested to kill you, you're already dead. Spiritually you're dead. What's the point of killing you? You're dead already. I'm interested that you get scared. You see all the punishments of the Torah. You see all the warnings, what's coming for you next. And you will repent that you should become alive. Meaning until now I consider you as a dead person. I give you money, I give you home, children, wife, cars, a job. You're charismatic, you do whatever you do. But you are 100% dead in my eyes. 100%. Ah, you started to keep Shabbat. Finally, you got connected after 40 years. Now you begin to live. And that's what Rabbeinu Yonah said, Mit Yatsvim al Darkei Atshuva. Entering the path, the destination to the direction of the truth. That's already a very big thing. Bezrat Hashem, we should have the merit to continue to elevate our soul, to inspire more, to listen to kosher speakers only, to read only kosher books. You're not sure about the origin of the book and who's the writer. Don't take the risk. One bad book and destroy your neshama and and inject venom into your system. Every time you see on a book a doctor, doctor rabbi, stay away from it. Trust me. Do not read that book. There is very few exceptions to the rule of some doctor, doctor rabbis that are kosher. Very, very few. You can count on one hand how many. Almost all of them are heretics. The university clog their judgment, clog their vision, destroy their vision. What they used to know when they were in yeshiva, it's all gone with the nonsense of the university. The venom that the wicked professors and the material that they learn in a horrible, wicked university, it was all got mixed with all the lie of the horrible academic universities that when they write a book, there is much more poison in it than positive things. Now somebody say, okay, Rabbi, but there are some good pages in the book. There are some interesting things, inspiring moments. I want to ask you a question. If I give you one liter of water and I only put over there five milliliters of poison. Look at this water, how much pure water clean. Few drops. One, two, three drops. Fatal death. You don't even see it. 99% is beautiful water. Only a little bit poison. What will happen to you when you drink? You die just as fast. Right or wrong? Those are the books of those doctors. If they have endorsement, Rav Chaim Kanievsky, Rav Ovadia, Rav ben kosher authorities. I went over the book, not words of blessing. Don't get confused. Sometimes they just write blessing. I wish you, I, I bless you to be successful in your teaching. That's nothing. He didn't go over the book. If he writes, Karati ta sefer, Avarti ala sefer, it's beautiful, work of art, Irat shamayim, I'm blessed this rabbi to continue, da 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 da. You know, he went over the book. Okay. Rav Mazuz approved it. Some serious Talmud Chacham approved it. All you need is one Talmud Chacham. Two is better, five is better. But one serious, if Rav Victor Miller gives you a book, read it. You don't have to check the endorsement. It's okay, we'll never give you heretic books. But today there are so many heretics, writers and speakers. You've got to be very careful because one of them can destroy you. What? Every one of the 16 in my list, it's death penalty to your soul immediately. You listen to five minutes of their clips. You're not allowed to look in their face. They are Machtiya Rabim. 
the clown from Englewood, the one from Boca Raton, the one from Minnesota. There's a list of them. There's another kofer that all Gdole Israel put him on a ban. He moved to Bet Shemesh. Say the world is billions of years old. Science is more important than what the Torah says in his eyes. He admired the scientists, not the rabbis. There's a lot of dangerous out there. Some of them are inactive, Baruch Hashem. Since the, we put them in a list, Hashem wiped them out. One of them died. It's not alive anymore. The other ones are very silent. But the ones who make the biggest damage is the clown from Englewood, the one from Boca, and the one, the Santa Claus. And the chief rabbi, the chief clown of England. Those are the most dangerous right now that continue to inject venom to the heart of thousands of from Jews. You got to be very careful from them. Do, according to the Torah, you cannot count them in a minyan, any one of them. You have nine people and they walk in, you can say Kaddish. It's brachot levatala. They are not mitztaref le minyan. Any one of them. They kofer, kofrim. Santa is one level above heresy. Heresy means you, you disagree with what Chazal say. You make fun at some of the things the Gemara say. You take what the, what the scientists say and you contradict the Torah. Okay, that's heresy. But Santa went one step further. He actually rise a war against Hashem. A war against Hashem. I didn't ask to come to the world. You have no right to tell me what to do. You can judge me. I don't have to apologize to you. You have to apologize to me. We are tired. This. There's no such thing punishment. There's no such thing Gehenom. Declaration of war against God. Even the Muslims and the Christians don't dare to write such books. They have heresy by them. Different kinds of heresy. But I don't remember any priest or any Muslim Qadi or Imam that wrote a book to declare a war against God and to tell him, Don't, you have no right to tell us what to do. We didn't ask to come to the world. You were lonely and miserable and that's why you put us here. Because you made us here, because you are looking for entertainment, you have no right to tell us what to do. Basically, take the Torah and dump it in the toilet, according to this fool. Why? Because there's no, you have no right to punish us. All the warnings of the Torah, he had, no, he, no, he had no legal right to write it in your book. He cannot tell us what to do. We didn't ask to be created. So why are you giving us uh, instructions what to do? And based on that, you want to punish us. We refuse to accept your authority. That's what his book is all about. Do you understand the difference between regular heresy to this one? That's already the worst you can imagine. The worst is creating a spiritual holocaust to everyone who listens to him. I said all the warnings that you need. The rest is on you. At least I know when it comes to this, at least I did a good job. Why? I brought it to the awareness of so many innocent, naive people. Some people didn't believe in the beginning. I wrote in an, an entire letter. It's, re, it's already in my phone. I immediately send it. I don't have to retype it. It's written. All the sources of every one of his videos. When people told me, oh, you exaggerate. Come on. It's not so bad. Immediately I send them that letter. Always. Always. And immediately after that, a letter of apology. I'm sorry. I should have believed what you say. As soon as they read, what's that? Wow, it cannot be. He really say that? Can you show me where the video is? I have to waste time on this nonsense to send them the actual video that they see. The one that already passed had an interview. They asked him, what about Adam and Eve? Did it really happen or is it just a parable? Adam <laughs> v'chava. He was the chief rabbi of England, Rabotai. Just to show you that this title, chief rabbi, means nothing. It's all a political title. So you say, no, there was no Adam and Eve. It's a parable. What about the exodus of Egypt? The Red Sea split and uh, was an exodus of Egypt or is also a parable? Also a parable. 
How do we know which parts of the Torah is real and which parts of the Torah is parable? Every time that what the Torah say comply with what the scientists say, it's real. Once it does not, it's parable. How long did I speak now? One minute. The interview was about three, four minutes. I can send it to you if you don't believe me. I send it to a hundred people. One of my good friends was a big admirer of that one and have every one of his books had. When I told him that, he almost broke up his relationship with me. So angry. Because, you know, he, w he used to live in England. I used to be close with him. He said to me, that's it. Now you went too far. And I said to him, you don't have to believe me. I'm a type of person that if I say something, I always back it up. Always. You never catch me say something that doesn't have a source. Never. It's a solid rule by me. I'm not sure I don't talk. Yes, I want to see. It took two or three minutes. I sent him the video after that. He said, I will, nev I will never ever waste a minute on this kofer. I was a good personal friend with him. It wasn't just someone who read his books. Personally, friends. I don't want to hear his name ever again. I dump all his books out of my house. Where did you find a religious leader that said there was no Adam and Eve? You know, one of the greatest speakers today in the world that does very good PR for Israel and is very much against Hamas, is interview everywhere. They call him to the top university. He makes debates with all kinds of Palestinian fools. He's great. When it comes to politics, he's one of the best. Brilliant. Great IQ, great knowledge, sharp speaker, very convincing. Religious, zero level. I saw an interview with him a year ago. He said, I don't believe uh, the, about the existence of the soul. He doesn't believe there is a soul. Did you ever see in your life a person that says that he's religious, put a yarmulke on his head, and then he said, I don't believe there is such a thing as soul? Find me another case like this in history. The most brilliant person in politics, Zero knowledge in Judaism. Isn't it a shame? With such a brain and such a sharp thinking and such a brilliance, could have been one of the best rabbis in the world. I'm sure that if you will learn one year in a yeshiva, it would be like 10 years of someone else with this kind of head. One year would be like 10 years. Give him three, four years in yeshiva. He will be the best speaker in a religious world, by far. He doesn't believe there is a soul. Why don't you read? Why do you waste all your energy about politics? What about your soul? doesn't believe there is a soul. I hope he changed his mind since a year ago. What a contradiction. You're walking with the Yamaka and you don't believe there is a soul? The whole Torah is about the soul. <laughs> whole afterlife is about the soul. Every mitzvah is for the soul. What? For the body? Why do you put filin? For the body? You eat matzah for the body? You put mezuzah in a door for the body? Every mitzvah, learning to write for the body? Gemara, it's for the body? What, what is this? If you don't have a soul, there's no point of wasting a minute on religion. We are dogs. Dogs don't need to be religious if there's no soul. If there's no soul, you're a chimpanzee. Chimpanzee needs to put fill in. You get the point or no? Person can live in a complete contradiction. Complete. Complete contradiction. One moment you're religious, the next moment you're the biggest heretic. Why is it? Because you don't learn Jewish Ashkafa. He never had teachers. He probably never went to yeshiva. He never got the proper Jewish education. Probably went to the best public school, private school, best universities. Over there, you do not learn to be a tzaddik. You learn to be a rasha over there, not a tzaddik. Yes, you're a great doctor. Yes, you're a great lawyer. Yes, yes, you're the sharpest academic guy. If you're 100% ignorant in Torah. And Hashem only cares about Torah. 
Not that you're a doctor, not that you're a lawyer, not that you're a president. That's nothing. Don't ever think that being a great doctor, you impress Hashem. Or being a great lawyer, you impress Hashem. No, 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 absolutely not. You're the best basketball player in the world. You're nothing in the eyes of Hashem. Just like another donkey. If you're a tzaddik, Talmid Chacham, you are everything for Hashem. Hashem did not want to destroy millions of people in Sodom before he speaks to Avraham Avinu and inform him that this tragedy is coming to the world. Why? I will not disrespect the tzaddik. I will not disrespect you. I am informing you specially. Be ready. I'm going to wipe out all the wicked people in the world. But I don't want you to be upset and surprised. That's why, because you care, I care about you, you mean a lot to me, I come to inform you about my plan. When Hashem does something now, does He inform any one of us? We're not Avraham Avinu. Be'ezrat Hashem we will be. And we will be very soon, Be'ezrat Hashem. Baruch Adonai. Amen.